This episode is brought to you by Lightpoint, of which I'm the principal engineer. Lightpoint provides the collision reconstruction community with data and education to facilitate and elevate analyses. Our most popular product is our exemplar vehicle point clouds. If you've ever needed to track down an exemplar, you know it takes hours of searching for the perfect model, awkward conversations with dealers, and usually some cash to grease the wheels. Then back at the office, it takes a couple more hours to stitch and clean the data, and that eats up manpower and adds a lot to the bottom line of your invoice. Save yourself the headache so you can spend more time on what really matters, the analysis. Lightpoint has already measured most vehicles with a top-of-the-line scanner, like his RTC360, so no one in the community has to do it again. The exemplar point cloud is delivered in PTS format, includes the interior, and is fully cleaned and ready to drop into your favorite programs, such as Cloud Compare, 3DS Max, Rhino, Virtual Crash, PC Crash, among others. Head over to lightpointdata.com slash datadriven to check out the database and receive 15% off your first order. That's lightpointdata.com slash datadriven. Hello, everyone. My guest today is Mr. Anthony Cornetto. Tony Cornetto is a forensic engineer and collision reconstructionist holding bachelor's and master's degrees in engineering from Virginia Tech, as well as a professional engineering license. Tony has 25 years of experience in the forensic industry, starting his career with FTI, which then became SEA, in 1999, informing Momenta, a consulting engineering firm, in 2016. He has authored numerous publications on the use and validity of computer simulations and became the principal at Engineering Dynamics Corporation, creators of the esteemed simulation suite HVE, in 2020. Tony has also conducted research and authored papers regarding mechanical engineering, vehicle performance, electronic data recorders, and demonstrative evidence. He is consistently pushing the boundaries in photogrammetry, 3D modeling, and simulation. He has testified in trials on both state and federal levels and has been kind enough to make some time to talk shop today uh, at no charge from what I hear. So thanks uh, so much for being here, Tony. Sure. Thank you. I appreciate it. So one of the interesting things to me for most forensic engineers is just how the heck they got into the industry. Uh, if you're anything yeah. like me, when you were in undergrad, you had no idea what forensic engineering was. So what was your path from undergrad to grad school to engineering? And, and how did you first hear about forensic engineering? So I, I kind of consider it a hidden industry in a way. It's like it's not very, uh, very much talked about. You don't see it at job fairs. Um, maybe more today, but back then, uh, I didn't see it at any type of job fair. So I did my undergrad in engineering science mechanics. Uh, I had an interest in biomechanics. Uh, so I concentrated in that area, uh, went on to do my master's degree in engineering mechanics with a concentration in biomechanics, uh, biomaterials, bioengineering. And then afterwards, uh, was looking for what to do next and ended up getting a position at Johns Hopkins Hospital, uh, which I thought was uh, uh, perfect coming out of grad school. Uh, ended up working for a retinal surgeon, Eugene Dewan. Um, it was kind of the perfect timing for me because he had just transferred from Duke to Johns Hopkins. And um, he had set up a lab basically in the basement of Wilmer Eye Institute, like no windows, nothing. We were down in a dungeon. And we had our own machine shop. And basically, he had come up with a, a new surgery for macular degeneration called macular translocation. And he needed instruments for eye surgery. So we developed the instruments there and actually had the machine shop make come and we'd take them up into the surgical room and, uh, and put them in the autoclave. And then he could use them as long as it wasn't anything like lasers. Uh, those we had to go through a whole process. So while I'm there uh, for about a year, year and a half, uh, we're doing all of that. And uh, one of my coworkers was a Johns Hopkins graduate. He had seen a presentation by Joe Reynolds, who was the co-founder of FTI Consulting, also a Hopkins mm. graduate. And we had been talking about what to do next in our lives, careers. And I was looking for somebody that was doing biomechanical type work, but I didn't really want to go to a big industry. Um, and he's like, oh, you should check out FTI Consulting. Uh, so that was my introduction to forensic engineering uh, was because somebody saw a presentation uh, by someone else. And I started doing research into it. FTI Consulting happened to be uh, a half hour down the road from me. They had some positions open. 
I, I wanted to get in. So they had a position in animation and they had a position in um, mechanical engineering. So I applied for both. Uh, animation back then, too. I mean, that's pretty early on to be into animation. That's impressive. My introduction to to that area started at, at, in the college level. But while at Hopkins, when we were making these uh, instruments for this um, this new surgery, we also had to create a demonstration on how to do the surgery so that we could then uh, supply that to the doctors that were going to be using it. So we had a little department that was creating uh, demonstrations, demonstratives, basically using um, Macromedia Director back then or Flash. Oh, yeah. Uh, way back. Which yeah. got bought out by Adobe or something like that, if I remember. Yeah. Correctly. Yeah. So, um, so I had an introduction to that world and I thought, okay, I'm going to get in either through mechanical engineering or through, uh, animation. Uh, the uh, guy who ran the animation department, he said, uh, take the mechanical engineering job if they give it to you and I'll use you as I can. Uh, yeah. so I ended up getting a position as a mechanical engineer. Um, and yeah, that's how I ended up at, uh, FTI. That's pretty cool. And then, so they were eventually bought out by SEA or maybe they were part and parcel for a little bit. Uh, and you stayed there for, for what, 17 years or so? So they actually, right around the time when I started at FTI, they had purchased SEA. They had bought SEA. Uh, and then there was a, after they were together for a while, and then SEA was um, basically sold back, back off. But yeah, I was there for 17 years. Um, again, I started off in mechanical engineering doing uh, forensic analysis of, you know, all kinds of mechanical failures. And at the time, Fauzi Bayon had started the Accident Reconstruction Group in Annapolis. He had come over from expo, uh, failure analysis at the time, and he had a lot of work. And so I started uh, talking to Fauzi and working my way in, uh, doing work with him. And next thing you know, I'm in the vehicle group. Uh, That's and then cool. I stayed there for, for a long time. So. Yeah. And is that the primary uh, makeup of your casework at this point? Do you still do mechanical failures and whatnot, or is it almost all recon traffic related things? It's almost all vehicle with some uh, fall type cases. Yep. Um, okay. And the, the group at, um, at SEA and Fauzi's group that he, he had done uh, while he was at failure, that's what he had kind of learned to do was, vehicles and, and falls. And so I followed in his footsteps, so to say. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, yeah. I had a, a little bit of that as well. I worked uh, with Eric Dial at Dial Engineering in Culver City for a while. And he, uh, he did a lot of that as well. Slip and fall, also big, huge, sophisticated collision reconstructions, and then also failure analyses. And I think potentially, I mean, maybe this is something we'll talk about as well as we go down the rabbit hole a little bit farther. But Back then, I think it might have been a little bit easier to do a lot of different things and be good at them, whereas now things are just becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, it's very difficult to be good at, at everything if you're not really focused. Uh, you know, it's funny when new engineers um, would ask me if I had any recommendations for them, and I'd say, uh, find something to make it your focus. Um, yeah. For example, and you know, motorcycles for you. Yeah. Um, when I was at SEA, simulation became one of my focuses. You know, I was I was um, known for being able to do simulation work, uh, and then also night visibility. And so those are kind of the two areas that I continued to do uh, research in. Yeah, and then that brings me to a next thing. We'll probably jump back and forth a little bit in sure. your background because there's a there's a lot there, but. Obviously, looking at your publication list, which is 30 long or something like that, a bunch of that revolves around high-end, sophisticated computer simulation analyses of car crashes. Uh, and I imagine that you were using HVE at the time. Uh, yes. And then eventually you became the owner of HVE, which is uh, is just amazing because that program has been around since 1984, you know, Terry Day. Uh, founder and just uh, kind of a staple of our entire industry and to be the owner of that. Uh, pretty amazing. So how did that come, come about? It's an interesting story. Um, so after uh, my time at SEA, uh, Jeff Suway had recently uh, gone off on his own, um, mm. just to bring Jeff into it. He and I were doing, uh, we worked together at SEA. Uh, he was out in California uh, and we were 
talking about night visibility type work um, and started doing some research papers together. And we authored, I guess it was four papers over two years, but when uh, I'm trying to think if it was the first set or the second, but we were presenting them at SAE, World Congress. And while I'm up there, uh, I knew Terry was going to be in town and, uh, and Terry and I had a relationship through uh, HVE and he had asked me to instruct at the advanced, um, uh, the advanced class at the uh, HVE forum. So I called him up and said, Hey, we're, you know, we're going to do dinner. Do you want to go out to dinner? And, uh, so the first night was kind of cool cause it was Jeff Sue and Jeff Mutart and Terry day and myself and Eric dial. And, uh, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, not Eric dial. It was, uh, from Principia, Erica Rossetier, maybe? There was a bunch of us, you know, at the table, and I'm sitting here thinking, wow, this is impressive. I'm with some some pretty uh, pretty smart people here some uh, and well-recognized people, you know. And um, Was that the pizza place in, in Detroit? Oh, I can't remember what place it was, but um, it was, we had a nice big table. Um, and some beer, probably. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, and so that was a great night. Uh, night two, though, I, I asked Terry if he wanted to go out to dinner. Uh, and so Terry and I went out to dinner and I um, I was basically said, hey, I'm interested in what the future of HVE is when you decide you want to uh, retire. And, yeah, it kind of uh, had been on all power users mind at that point because Terry's so brilliant and knows the program so well and helped develop it. And obviously, Terry can't be at the helm forever. So I think all of right. us were wondering who has the capability to take this over. So you weren't alone with that sentiment. He said that, you know, basically he didn't have a, an immediate plan, but he reached out to me, uh, I guess not quite a year later. And it was November. He called me up and he said he had a plan that he was looking for someone who was uh, a user of HV, longtime user, engineer, interested in the future, you know, so on and so forth. And I'm like, yeah, I'm your guy, Terry. Uh, and yeah. then next thing you know, uh, here we are. Uh, little did we know at that time that like, you know, four months later, the world was going to shut down. But um, yeah, so. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, my experience uh, started with the HV forum. Uh, right after the forum in Austin, uh, it was the end of February, March 1st, I took over, you know, what, March 18th or so COVID shut the world down. So it was a, uh, surprise. Was yeah. Start. Yeah. <laughs> Good yeah. luck growing it. And, and, you know, one of the things that it, it, I, I had known your reputation over the years, but you and I never really interacted until uh, IPTM maybe a year and a half or two ago. And then we just kind of hit it off pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, but I was always a little bit hesitant about who could take it over after Terry, just because he's uh, a bona fide genius. But um, in developing a relationship with you, it's, it's clear he picked the right guy. Oh, and part you. of that is just like your engineering intelligence. But then the other part of that is your, you have your finger on the pulse of the community you know what's important to everybody in the community. And then you also have these big chops in the field of uh, 3D modeling and rendering and using Blender and uh, 3D renders like Unreal Engine and things. And it seems like there's eventually going to be a, 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 some integration of those things just in that the physics of HVE are obviously uh, – the, the, you know, cream of the crop. Um, yeah. but then the graphics, uh, ha have never been cream of the crop. They haven't been intended to be cream of the crop. Uh, but right. it seems like there's an opportunity there for you to kind of blend your expertises and bring it to the next level. I I'm not sure if that's even on your horizon. How do you think about that? Yeah, so absolutely. It, it, it's, um, I kind of look at it like Terry was, uh, focused on physics first, which he should be because it's a physics program, you know, and so that that was the um, that that was the main focus. And it's and it's great. You know, the physics is great. And uh, I come at it from a little bit of a different point of view because I was a longtime user. So I'm looking at it from a user point of view where Terry hasn't been uh, in the field for a long time. 
Uh, so he was he, he didn't see it the same way that I see it. So my focus became uh, user interface, um, you know, yeah. trying to improve areas like, uh, you know, number of mouse clicks <laughs> to get to various <laughs> things, uh, yeah. improving um, the date, you know, how you see the data, the graphs, things of that nature. Uh, and then I've been thinking for a long time about how to move to a better graphics engine in some way. Um, and that's, you know, that's definitely on the horizon. Uh, it's not easy to choose a graphics engine uh, yeah. and we can, you know, get into that. But, um, uh, that kind of goes to, I think that users are, are interested in, in improved graphics today. There's an expectation today that, that, um, you can get good graphics easily. Yeah. Wow. From the simulator, which is kind of novel, you know, in the past, you know, 10 years ago, I don't think anybody expected great uh, demonstratives to be spit out by their simulation package. They kind of expected to take that data and bring it over to uh, 3ds Max or Blender or something like that. Uh, but right. now, yeah, it's, it's shifting that way. And one thing that, you know, I'm, I'm an HVE user as well, and I've been to the forums, and I think it's really cool that you get all of these interested users together annually, post-COVID and pre-COVID, and everybody exchanges ideas. There's workshops, there's white papers. People are always kind of pushing the boundaries of what you can do with HVE. And I know you just hopped out of, uh, what well, in Fort Myers, you just had uh, the HVE forum a couple weeks back. Yeah. So uh, how, how did that go and what's on the horizon there? What kind of new things are you seeing the community developing? So the forum went really well. Um, it wasn't uh, the biggest forum that we've had. I think post COVID we've been virtual for the last two years. So this is the first in-person post COVID. Uh, what was great is we had a lot of new users, which is always good for the future. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that was exciting to see because I know that moving forward, we're going to see those users coming back. Um, as far as uh, big changes for me, the biggest one, and, and uh, you know, a lot of people we're talking to may not be aware of HV's uh, physics, but uh, Simon and Dimesh um, are the, I guess, the um, top end physics package within HVE where you're doing full three-dimensional um, simulation of vehicle dynamics and also uh, the, the impact portion. Uh, and one of the things that was added is the ability for the, di for the wheels, the die mesh wheels to interact with the environment. Hmm. And it seems kind of like, oh, you know, um, not a huge deal, but f for me, it was a huge deal. Uh, so for example, you can drive over a curb and the wheel the die mesh wheel will actually interact with that curb. And in the advanced course, I had everybody set up different vehicles and we all use the radial spring tire model, which is, uh, you know, has springs coming in, in whatever span. And then which runs pretty slow because you have a whole yeah. bunch of springs. I remember that. Yeah. I remember that very distinctly. Yeah. Yeah. It runs really slow. So we, we did that side by side with the new die mesh, uh, wheel to environment impact model and showed that they match really well. Uh, and die mesh is significantly faster than the radio. Oh, that's awesome. Model. So for me, that's like a, you know, a big, huge new, uh, feature within HVE. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, the ability to iterate quickly is imperative in these simulations because nobody ever gets it right the first go around. Right. And, and it also for doing complex like rollovers, um, anytime you have the wheels hit the ground uh, with a full three dimensional you know, vehicle dynamics, you know that, that um, if you only are modeling it as a point on the bottom of the tire, you can get weird things happening. But now because the wheel can actually interact with the ground, when you're doing rollovers, those wheels will contact on, on all sides. Uh, it's a, it's a full mesh wheel that can now hit the ground. So rollovers and then vehicle to vehicle impacts, you have more control over how the wheels can interact with each other. So, yeah, sometimes that's huge. Sometimes that's a huge part of, of the collision dynamics. So that's, that's, that's cool. Yeah. And then, uh, the other big one for me is, the uh, and I think you and I have talked about it a bit in the past, but using simulation to to match EDR data, 
um, and how that's uh, being done more often today. And, and I think uh, HV can really shine in that, in that area. Yeah. I was thinking about that. I mean, 20 years ago, uh, the, 2003, there were still a lot of vehicles on the roadway that didn't have EDRs. And now I think I saw recently in one of Rick Ruth's presentations, it's something like 95 to 99% of vehicles rolling off the assembly line have an EDR, uh, they have a black box on board. So it's just more and more common that we get data and we want to match that via some simulation to make sure that we have the dynamics, right? Uh, right. so that, that kind of is the now that, that is the future. And I guess that brings up, uh, something that I, I know you have thoughts on, which is the complexity of varying simulations. You know, there's a bunch of different simulation platforms out there, even within the HVE suite. And it kind of depends on what you're after and how much time you can spend and how much money you have to spend on your simulation package in general, what tool you should be using. So yeah. how do you think about that? And uh, I, I guess what's available within H HVE and then how do you look at what's available in the whole community and w what tool is right when? HVE has a Crash 3 module called Ed Crash. It's got a SMAC module called Ed SMAC. It's got Ed SMAC 4 and I'll kind of go into them, but, and then it has various other uh, single vehicle simulators and then it's got Simon with Dimesh. And so Ed Crash would be, uh, to do um, energy momentum, you know, it's not a simulation, it's a reconstruction tool. Um, SMAC is based on the original uh, SMAC model. So Ed SMAC, you're doing uh, some vehicle dynamics with some impacts. Ed SMAC 4 allows you to do the same thing, but drive on a three-dimensional road. And then Simon is full three-dimensional vehicle dynamics and um, impact. Uh, the impact can actually take place in three dynamics. Uh, in three dimensional, um, also the, it's, so it's mesh to mesh interaction as opposed to what I would call it like shoe box to shoe box interaction. Yeah. As to, as opposed to like two planar vehicles interacting with each other. Once you get to Simon, now it's got three, three dimensional crush, three dimensional interactions. The vehicles sure. are rolling and they can, you can simulate the rollover aspect of it as well. Or, um, in right. and, and, and smack, you're, you're getting weight transfer, weight transfer is being modeled, right? So there is some component that is being considered like CG height and how that affects tire loading and things like that. There is a, um, load transfer coefficient that's used, but it's not actually looking at the dynamics of that vehicle and how it might roll over or lift from the ground. Right. There's no sprung mass, so to say, Okay. where in Simon, you have the, the you actually have a suspension. So that the the um, body can actually is sprung relative to the wheels and and axles, and then and then you have other simulations that you're looking at. I mean, I, I see you're doing uh, a lot of light simulation, which is a different tool that does something different. And then you've got uh, vehicle dynamic simulators in general, and so. Simon, obviously, it has a more sophisticated tire model as well, which then kind of goes back to if you need to simulate the vehicle dynamics alone, what are the best tools for that? Well, I, I guess I'll start at, um, you know, the, the when I think of a vehicle simulator for accident reconstruction, we have the tire model, we have the vehicle model, and we have the impact model. Um, and there's a, there's a whole range of programs out there that you can use depending on what your application is. And they all have their purpose and, and, you know, and some are more useful at, at different times, but for example, virtual crash, PC crash, um, HVE, MSMAC 3D, car sim, truck sim, bike sim, LS Dyna. Um, you know, that, the, you, you probably aren't going to use LS Dyna on your intersection accident with two vehicles that, that hit in the intersection, but you may use LS Dyna when there's a question about the A-pillar crushing in or something that is very complex that uh, you need a full finite element analysis. Um, and so I think each one has its, has its place, uh, and that's why they're all used in the industry, uh, depending on what type of accident you're trying to model you're going to select the appropriate tool for the job. Sometimes the appropriate tool is an Excel spreadsheet. You know, I mean, we do that yeah. a lot or MathCAD or whatever um, your, your program of choice is. 
Um, yeah, it doesn't always have to be this twenty five, thirty thousand dollar tool. And if we were yeah. all infinitely rich, we would probably just have all of these things. But the other thing is, of course, that you need to get comfortable with that platform. You need to spend the time learning it. And yeah. I just bought Bike Sim. And I've been uh, messing around with that and trying to learn it. And I think it'll be quite some time before I'm, I'm really good at it. So there is something to be said for picking a tool that you think will be effective most of the time yeah. and learning that. Because even the best tool, if it's misused, is not as good as uh, an okay tool that you're really comfortable with and you're using it properly. Yeah, and and, and I would say that that's absolutely true um, where – you start on a certain tool set, you become an expert in that tool set and you continue to use that for your career. I, I kind of think of it like Apple and Samsung or something like that. It's like, you know, I like my yeah. iPhone. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're not very likely to make the switch. Yeah, it's harder to switch when you've been using a program for so long. But but there are times where certain programs just can't can't do what you're trying to model. Um, and, and bike sims a, a perfect example. I don't know anybody else that can model, uh, motorcycle dynamics, the way that bike sim models it. If you're trying to look at the dynamics of, of, uh, how a motorcycle is moving. Yeah, I, exactly. Not... They, they've done a great job at figuring that out and setting up a system that's relatively easy to use. Uh, unless you want to build your own multi-body simulator, it's like best to just buy their package. That's already fine tuned. Uh, yeah. but it's going to cut off at impact. So you, you, you're not going to be modeling uh, any impulse exchange. So at that point, you know, it's kind of, you need one SIM for pre-impact dynamics, potentially not always, of course, but, and then yeah. another simulator for the impact itself. And, you know, I like, I, there's a lot of papers uh, for HVE and modeling motorcycle impacts by Eric Dial and Todd Frank. And I think uh, Charles Funk wrote one and Stein Husher wrote one. So, I have these papers, I can put them in my back pocket, show up at depot, show up at trial and say, this is what I'm using the tool for. And, yeah. and it's, it's validated. So there's a lot, um, to be, to be said for that. And, uh, you know, one of the things that is getting attention right now a lot is, is, uh, matching EDR data. And I know before we started recording, you and I were talking about a case study that you had where you had the lateral acceleration of the target vehicle, you had the roll of the target vehicle. And with the more sophisticated sims, like the 3D simulation, and if you have a good vehicle model, including suspension characteristics, you can vary impact speeds, vary dynamics until you're matching a multitude of, of things. And once you get that, that's kind of the best feeling. And you know that you're really close to the, to the true answer. Yeah. Yeah, if you um, if you hit in the you know impact location and and then you look at the the roll dynamics and the lateral acceleration and they're following the same you know they they line up on the graph you're getting similar peaks you're getting similar uh, time you know between peaks uh, it's it's rewarding in that way it's like okay yeah I'm close one of the things that came up I think. It might have been last year or two years ago. There was a whole bunch of papers uh, or articles about offset um, location of the accelerometers in vehicles and the fact that they're not at the CG. Yeah. Uh, and then figuring out how to calculate the effect of the offset of the accelerometer. And that's another place where, um, you know, simulation can be helpful because you can place an accelerometer in the vehicle at a location where the actual box is located in the vehicle. And then when you're looking at the results of your, your simulation, you can look at the acceleration at that location uh, and compare that to your, your CDR download and say, okay, you know, the lateral acceleration at the CG is not always the same as it is in front of the CG, especially when we're talking about a motorcycle impact or something like that, where you're hitting at the front and you're just getting like a rotation out of the vehicle. Yep. Um, you know, if the accelerometer is forward, we can look at that and, and match it in the correct location. So I think that's a, you know, pretty powerful use of a simulation tool. Um, the, uh, then you were discussing the, um, the role dynamics and the fact that, you know, that's takes into account suspension characteristics and, and where do we get that information from? Um, and so for at EDC, we, 
when we document a vehicle, we're measuring suspension characteristics. Uh, vehicle Metrics, who builds a database for, e for EDC, when they document a vehicle, they're measuring suspension characteristics. So those are included in the database of vehicles. Um, but yeah, that's certainly awesome. You can, yeah, and 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 you can go out and measure your own vehicles, and we we can we have um, uh, presentations on how to do that if you want to document your own vehicle to build it. Yeah, I'm curious how vehicle. how would you how do you measure what well, you get? I imagine spring rate and damping coefficient; those are the two big things for each. So we're meal. getting spring rate. The damping coefficient um, is based on um, specifications that okay. uh, yeah that we can get. Uh, there's also, so, so you can measure it by, you know, actually compressing and, and, um, hanging the vehicle. You could send it to somewhere like, uh, I think like SEA has, has different capabilities or exponent where they might have machines that, or the manufacturers, uh, where they can put the vehicle on a machine and, and take measurements. Um, there's other ways of doing it. I, you, you know, you can do like an oscillation of the suspension and, yeah. and measure the, um, frequency and, and back into a, um, a ride rate doing that. Yeah, I was talking with Damian Hardy a couple of weeks back, and I don't know if you know that name, but he's a very astute vehicle dynamics expert and has worked at a lot of the manufacturers and very uh, talented when it comes to simulation. And I was talking to him a little bit about what I was hoping to equip my shop with, which is a shock dynamometer so that we can get the damping coefficients. And he's like, yeah, I mean, that would be awesome. If you can't do that at times, what we've done is just take a motorcycle and roll it off of a foot long, a foot high drop and video it in high speed and then see what the response is and then go into sim and match that same response by varying the damping coefficient and you know you're pretty darn close at that point right and right. i was like that's that's brilliant yeah there's, yeah there's a lot of ways to skin a cat yeah 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 can we drop um, vehicles that that we yeah. could do that uh in hv we could raise a vehicle up you know five feet off the ground let us hit I, yeah, that's a good idea. I, I'd say, you know, one of my uh, good advice uh, pieces of advice, I should say to like Hertz and Enterprise is never rent your car to a recon. It's a bad right. idea. You know, the right. things they're going to do to it between yeah. brake tests and crash tests and uh, yeah, dropping yeah. it off of a, a foot high cliff. I was joking at, at the HV forum. I, I was asking who had a rental car so we could go out and curb test it. <laughs> and uh, did somebody volunteer? No, I think Wes had one, but we didn't, Wes Grimes, but we didn't use his. But. Yeah, you got to get the full coverage. If you're a recon going to a recon conference, get the full call uh, coverage just in case. Yeah. You never know what you're going to be convinced to do. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Blender. Okay. I don't have any experience with Blender, mm -hmm. but I, I've talked with you a little bit about it in the past. It seems it's amazing. Open source stuff in general is super exciting to me. One of the big open source, just to go on a tiny of, bit of an open source tangent, we're using Cloud Compare right now. And it's really cool because there's all these composable tools that one person can develop and then they get plugged in. And this guy develops it because he needs it and it gets plugged in. And then you eventually have this extremely powerful piece of software that is free and has been funded by the Gen Pop, so to speak. Yeah. Um, you know, for cloud compare, Lightpoint just uh, worked with one of the developers to to build the tool, and now when the next beta release comes out, it's it's everybody's. We uh, footed the bill and just put it in because we want to actually be able to use it, and then everybody can use it. And I think open source has a huge advantage um, because of that composability. And Blender is the same uh, mentality. Of course, they're open source, and it's being developed by all sorts of random people and plugins are coming in and it seems to be similarly if not more powerful than 3ds max i think a lot of people that i've spoken with are switching over to it and i know you're using it in all sorts of unique ways from uh diagramming evidence to photogrammetry to high-end renderings to animations so i'd love to hear you kind of just talk about what your thoughts are on blender how you got introduced to it how you think reconstructionists can use it in their analysis. Then I'll probably have follow-up questions because I'm super interested in the photogrammetry aspect of it and how you're handling photogrammetry and modeling of roadway evidence and things like that. But uh, yeah, a big intro to a simple question is like, what, what's up with Blender? What's your experience with it? And how, could we, how should we all be thinking about it and maybe integrating it into our toolkit? I started with Blender... Kind of as a, uh, I needed a tool and I wasn't going to pay for the Autodesk suite at the time. 
Uh, and so I was looking for something um, open source and Blender popped up and I spent the time and there's plenty of YouTube videos to teach you how to do anything you want in Blender. And, and at first it was like, okay, I can do, I can use it for diagramming. I can use it for 3d modeling and, and animation. And then you realize that it's got a, um, a video editor built in. It's got a video composite, you know, a compositing system built in. Um, it has, um, now it has a real time render engine. It's got a, uh, ray tracing engine, render engine. Um, it's got a motion tracking system built in. Oh, wow. Uh, so like people who use PF track or something like that. I mean, Blender yeah. has its motion tracking capabilities. So you can, you, you can use it like PF track or you'd export a script from PF track and bring it in. No, you can track inside of Blender. Wow. Yeah. You can bring in a, a, a video and then track points in the video and then solve that like you would in PF track and then send it right over to the 3d environment. Since it's all in the same program, it's, it's integrated. It's pretty, Holy pretty cow. impressive. Yeah. yeah. That's nice because I know PF track, PF track isn't that expensive. It's like 1000 to $1,500 or something like that. But some of its competitors are more like $10,000. And of course you're right. learning a, a whole new platform. So if you can stick in blender and really, yeah. uh, uh, bolster your skills there, then you're, you can just stick in that sweet yeah you, the the thing with blender is there's so much that some people i think get overwhelmed because yeah, that's me right here yeah like i look at what is there and uh i would i'd love to and i'm i know yeah uh, for those that that uh don't know which is probably everybody listening i'm trying to convince tony to uh develop a class to teach all of us how to use blender because it seems totally overwhelming but super useful yeah so uh, okay, so you're using, are you analyzing collision videos in Blender? And if so, how? I'll bring in the... So, for example, like uh, if you're going to do a video from a, from a surveillance camera, like you got a still camera, um, and you, you can create a camera inside of Blender, which has whatever camera properties. So if you know the camera properties, it's a lot easier. And if it's a still camera, it's a lot easier. Uh, but you can place that camera in a 3D world. So if you go out and 3D scan your scene and you can create like a, a simple model or bring the scan points into Blender, uh, place the camera in the scene, and then you can actually uh, view through the camera both your video and your scene through yeah. the camera. So you, when you're in your camera view, uh, you know, you set your transparency of your video to 50% or something, and then you have your actual model in the background, and then you can do what people do in the other programs where they just drive their vehicles through or whatever you're trying to model, a pedestrian walking through, things like that. Yeah. Um, I made it sound simple, but it it is... Uh, yeah. yeah, and are you solving... So the way that I would traditionally do that is I'd go into Photo Modeler, I'd bring a point cloud from my collision site into Photo Modeler, and I would tell photo modeler, Hey, the 3d coordinates of this pixel are this of that pixel are that. And I would do that 20 or 30 times so that it knew exactly where the camera was. It knew exactly what the focal length of the camera was. And it knew the distortion parameters of the camera. Are you yeah. still doing that in photo modeler and then exporting camera parameters from photo modeler? Or can you do that in blender? So you can do that in blender. Um, sometimes, uh, if you have a, a camera, like I said, sometimes you can get the settings of the camera and you don't have to, but inside of what's called the movie clip editor, they also have where the motion tracking is in there. You can actually solve your camera and then yeah. it'll solve the distortion parameters. It'll solve for uh, focal length. It'll solve if there's, there, there's a, a bunch of settings that you can try to solve for. Um, w what's also nice is if you have a moving camera, it'll, it'll solve that also. Um, so for example, if you have a, if you have a camera driving down the road, uh, and you have all the white lines and you have signs and you have all that, and you have a 3d model of that scene and you can pick those points and solve the camera and then it'll place the camera in the 3d world. And you can align that solution to your scan of your roadway or whatever you have for the roadway. You can then align it. Uh, and make sure it's scaled properly and everything. And now your camera is actually driving through your scene based on a video. Um, and, yeah. you know, not at some point, I, you know, maybe we'll talk about the night visibility stuff, but that's something that Jeff and I do, Jeff Suway and I do um, quite often where he captures a video of a nighttime scene 
and we want to add CG to it. Yeah. And so it's not necessarily for for reconstructing an accident where we have video, but we actually want to create a CG inside of a of a video that he's captured. And that's the technique that we use. We actually track his video inside a blender and then place the CG object in the 3D scene. And then we have that that camera motion so we can um, composite the two together. The, uh, yeah, the CG. That, that looks so pro too. I've seen some of your work on that front and I've seen some other people do something similar. And one of the really cool things about that is of course the whole scene is photorealistic because it's from a video camera. And then you just put in a nice piece of CGI that yeah. is tough to detect as being CGI. It just gives the viewer a really uh, fidelic view of, of what was happening at the time. But of course, that takes a bunch of other skill to be able to put something in to that scene and have it be true to what the driver was potentially seeing, which brings us to that uh, those four papers you were talking about that you wrote with Jeff Sue in 2019 and 2020, uh, seems like the thrust of that was trying to figure out a way to scientifically do exactly that, like recreate what the driver or a rider, anybody in, the, in an environment would see under those lighting conditions. Instead of just saying like, well, this is consistent with what I saw when I was out there. It seems like you made it more of a quantitative approach using some interesting tools. Yeah. So the idea was how do you create in the computer environment real world lighting and can you create real world lighting in the computer environment? Um, and so there's, uh, you know, what you see on your, what you produce on your screen or, or you get from your camera is a display space, uh, lighting. Um, and so it's been, you know, you take real world lighting and you compress it down to what you can actually display. Um, but in the computer, inside of Blender or inside 3D Studio Max or, or other programs, you can have real world lighting where the range is zero to, you know, whatever floating point number you can get to. Uh, and that gets into like HDR imagery and things like that. So inside of Blender, uh, the, you, you actually create light sources that have real world lighting. And then uh, when you use the Cycles uh, render engine, it is a physics based uh, renderer. So it's actually bouncing light uses ray tracing. Um, and it, it calculates the amount of light that would, would be coming to uh, the camera. And it's a real world value. Now to display it, you have to then convert it to a display value, which is uh, the last step in the process. But what we were trying to show with these papers at least the first paper was that cycles is a validated physics based render engine and that you can create real world luminance inside of the computer environment. And you can actually create HDR imagery, open that up in, in an HDR program and take luminance measurements, um, that are, aren't zero to 255. They're, you know, zero to, um, a really high number. <laughs> That's crazy. So, and then yeah. Cycles is the uh, the rendering engine within Blender, and is that developed by the Blender team or who who makes that? So it, I'd have to look and see who originally developed it, but I would say it's probably the Blender team that that did it because okay. it's always been in Blender, but now I think you can use it in other programs too. Like you may be able to use Cycles in um, uh, Rhino. I think might be able to use Cycles. Yeah, and I'll put it in the show notes. I'll I'll put a link to cycles in the show show notes and some Blender stuff as well. And, and yeah. are they using that? I mean, why does that exist in the first place? It sounds like you're using a tool in a novel fashion, but they had it in there to begin with, maybe for merging CGI stuff with video to begin with for movies and things like that. Yeah, so I, I think that in the animation world or in the visual effects world, uh, they're interested in in creating realistic um visuals and the easiest way to create real realistic visuals is to use real world values um yeah. so instead of just making it look right they can actually put in a light with with a certain wattage and and it actually will calculate the correct reflections off the wall it has you know you your your surfaces have um 
value, you know, reflectance values that get applied. And so if you want something to look realistic and you're, if you use a physics based render engine, it, it normally is going to look better than if you're trying to just make it look right. Yeah. Um, so, so it's really the visual effects industry that, that one, you know, did all of this and, and you have big companies like Disney behind it. They, they, they generally are a little bit better funded than us, uh, yeah. Peasley reconstructionists. So, and then does that ultimately, and this might be a question better suited for Sue. So if you can't answer it, uh, totally understandable, but does your HDR camera then essentially become your light meter when you're out there at the nighttime at nighttime trying to see what the site looked like so jeff has some other papers that he authored on using um video and calibrating your camera um to make luminance measurements from your video or from photographs so if you imagine you have this huge range of of luminance values um but when you uh compress them down onto um no longer film, but digital film, you know, like a digital image, uh, there's a compression that's used and it, it's instead of it being linear, it's, it's kind of got a S shape to it. <clears throat> and he has a way of you backing that out to the real world luminance values. Now you're limited to the range, uh, that's, that's in the linear region not so much out on the toes because it gets so flat out there that you couldn't distinguish between values on the ends. But as long as you're in the middle range, you can back out of your video uh, luminance values. And yeah, he has some, uh, some papers that describe how to do that. And so what we w wanted to be able to do is say, okay, we have a video, we can reverse and get the luminance values. Now we have a CG, and we can create real world luminance values. Now we want to put those two together. And so part of the, this, the process is not just adding CG to your video, but making sure that when you then display them, that they're in the same display space. Uh, and in order to do that, you have to go from the video's display, display space to real world values. In the computer, we've already shown that you're, you're starting with real world values. And then when you render it back out, you're going back to a display space. But as long as they're in, they're aligned, it works and it looks right, you know, because it is, it's, it's correct. Yeah. It's scientifically founded. And, yeah. and, and, and then you have those papers to lean on. I imagine that uh, you guys have testified to, to this work uh, in the past and been able to do that because of this peer reviewed literature. Yeah. Yeah. And the, and so the other papers, well, one of them was validating cycles. And then we also came up with a method of capturing headlights, which is mm. part of the, the solution there also. Cause you know, you have your, your vehicle that you're driving through the scene that's creating the lighting in the video, but doesn't have the CG object. Well, we need those headlights in the computer so that the CG is lit by the headlights of the vehicle that we're driving, right? So he's driving through the scene and he's capturing video those headlights have to then light what's going on in our in our 3d world and so we came up with a method of capturing the headlights using hdr imagery um, and then you use that to actually create the light in the 3d world it's it's pretty cool yeah uh, this okay so this is a perfect example of why you need to pick your lane and stay stay in it and a lot of these analyses at this stage, 2023, should be multidisciplinary because there is zero chance of me having the time to learn that to the degree that you and Sue know it. And if I'm not going to, it's not something I can put in my toolkit, but the case might benefit from it. So it's like, yeah. all right, well, let's bring together everybody who's necessary to figure out how this case happened as accurately as possible. And in 1973, that was a totally different thing than 2023 when yeah. you have you have things like that that just require so much knowledge so much work and i'm sure you learned a lot as you're putting it all together for the paper and that's there's very few people out there who have that capability and you you just it's good to know about them and know who to call when you need them yeah the the last um 
paper then, well, the two of them had to do with uh, retro reflective materials, which are so unique. Um, yeah, because they, they reflect basically a perfect retro reflective material reflects back exactly to where the light's coming from. Um, now that wouldn't be good because typically the lights off from the viewer's position a little bit, but, right. uh, so they're, they're not perfect retro reflectors. Um, but they, they have a narrow band that they reflect back from where the light source is. And typically the driver is in that narrow band from their headlights to the retro reflective tape, which is why it lights up for the driver for their headlights, but not necessarily for the driver behind mm -hmm. them. It, your headlights don't light the retro the same way of for you it lights up but for the driver behind you it won't light up until their headlights light it because it's that angle you know yeah so we figured out how to model that in blender which again because blender has so many capabilities it has the ability to know where the light source is and where the camera is and so you can then tell it uh what the retro reflective um values are and model that within Blender. So we can create a wow. retro effect in our videos, which is why we were able to do, and you may have seen it, but uh, tractor trailers with with retro tape, we're able to model that inside of Blender. That's crazy. And it's calculating, there's some mathematical function where it's calculating the angle between the light source and the object and the, the camera position and modifying it for every time step. Yeah, so it uses uh, surface normal it uses the angle between the light source and the and the uh, the retro tape and the camera and the retro tape on the light source. So there, yeah, there's there's a couple angles going on there, and obviously as that angle changes, the, yeah. the retro number changes. So you have to know those angles, and there's a big formula that you have to plug in, and it does those calculations on the fly. That's crazy. So there's a spot for that in Blender where you can tell it, yeah, how it's going to change based on your research. Yeah. Jeez. I got to get, I got to get into this. I, I mean, maybe that's what I'll do for the rest of the year is try to yeah. learn Blender because yeah. uh, it seems like there's a lot there. And I guess the best thing to do is like you is pick one spot where you think that it could really benefit your analyses, learn that, learn it well, and then just kind of piece by piece, add a new thing when you need it. Yeah. yeah the, 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 if I do a course, uh, which I, it's on my list of things that I need to do. Um, and I'm thinking what it would be is like, you know, one day where it'll be more like intro to blender, just kind of how to yeah. get around it and totally and yeah. different areas are. And then, um, maybe a day on, uh, blender for reconstructionists and just some of the tools that I find useful for recon. For example, somebody authored a GIS, um, add on where you can go download, um, imagery aerial imagery that's that's geo it's geotagged and if you import that in through this add-on it automatically scales the aerial jeez which is yeah that's nice neat. yeah that's really neat i got so yeah that's that's definitely on my list and it's free which is good you just gotta take a little time which yeah. all of us have plenty of right we have plenty of time in this industry yeah, yeah. But, uh, too many cases not enough recons at this stage so if you're listening and you're not a reconstructionist yet uh it is uh an industry with a lot of job security at the moment and more more there's a lot more work than there are people to do it yeah um kind of sticking on photogrammetry for a bit what are you doing for like, are you using something like reality capture right now where you're taking a bunch of photographs of an object and creating 3D models of it? So I've experimented with um, some open source applications and then also Agisoft's uh, Metashape, which that's been a great program. Um, I've used 3D Zephyr. Uh, yeah, that's a great The open one. source is Meshroom. Um, mm. And then there's one that was that's absolutely great for uh, drone imagery called Open Drone Map ODM, hmm. um, and you, uh, it, it works really well. Dang! Um, so is that what are you? Uh, I know a lot of the community right now is using Pix4D. I think that the tide seems to be turning a little bit just because it's three hundred fifty dollars a month or something like that to have access to that, where a lot of these open source photogrammetry algorithms can 
handle it now. So how are you processing drone imagery? And what do you, what, have you experimented? Yeah. So I, yeah. I'll, I will say I'm, I'm not doing as much of that type of work, um, mm. you know, but when I was doing more of that work, uh, you know, a few years ago, I would run it through uh, Agisoft. And then there was a period where I was pretty much using ODM, uh, Open Drone Map for, for everything. Um, and you can build your own uh, server if you want, and you can process it locally. Uh, hmm. Or you can process it on uh, servers that other people have built, and you know you pay a small fee, and I think it's a per photo fee, but it's it compared to Pix4D, it's it's relatively yeah. inexpensive. But Pix4D, I guess, isn't that much either in the big picture. Yeah, I mean, I I guess what three fifty to four four five grand a year, something like that. It's it adds up, and and it's totally worth it if it's the best tool out there. Yeah. Uh, right now, that that is what we're using. It just seems like there's room for exploration, especially with reality capture. Uh, similar to what we were talking about, how Blender has modules that have been funded by Disney and things like that. Uh, reality captures purchased by Epic Games re recently and their budgets are just huge. So yeah. the R&D that has gone into reality capture and how quickly it processes things and how uh, how tailored it can be and the price is preposterous. I think if I load four or 500 photographs into that, it's like they want maybe $8 or something to process. It. And I'm like, yeah, for sure. Um, so I, I'm exploring that. I haven't finished my exploration of that, but it seems like that is going to be a good tool for creating orthos and 3D models from drone imagery. And speaking of Epic, they are one of the big sponsors of, of Blender. Oh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. And that started a um, couple years ago where they they fund they put a big fund uh, towards Blender. So the development has really improved in the last few years. So Blender was on the series two, I think. Um, now they're into three. And, and if you open up Blender three point anything, uh, it looks a lot different than 2.79. If you had opened it five years ago and was like, oh, this is hard to get around. It's changed a lot. Uh, and cool. a lot of that has been since they've they've got some big funding behind them. Well, yeah, we appreciate that. I guess everybody who bought, well, they make some huge video game that I don't, I don't maybe it's Minecraft or something like that, but they're, they're obviously really well funded and we'll take any of the trickle down effect of, yeah. uh, you know, Hey, sure. My kids are, uh, they're junkies and they're in front of the TV for 12 hours a day. But if I get better tools at the office, I'm all for it. Uh, right. Right. <laughs> yeah. They offer, um, oh, it, it, Epic games, they offer mega grants to people where you can, apply for a epic grants mega you know a mega grant and they'll fund you for your project if if you um are going to potentially use say like unreal engine or, um of one of their because they they're the they're the uh company behind unreal engine okay yeah and which is is free right anybody can go download it and, and, and use it for their application right now so if you you can build an application that's free if you're going to sell your application then there's a um, a fee that you pay for that. Actually, yeah, that reminds me of one thing I meant to ask you. So uh, we're, we're talking about the graphics and HVE and potentially using something like Unreal Engine. And then we were talking about Blender and scripts and how you can render beautiful things, of course, in there. Is there a, a world where these things don't necessarily become part of HVE, but HVE has the ability to generate a script that you can then just bring over into Blender with the same meshes that you used in HVE and it's on the same coordinate system and you just say, all right, we did all the physics over there, now render it beautiful in Blender. So right now you can bring over the motion data, you can't bring over the the mesh data, um, but I've that's something I've been trying to think a lot about. Like, do we bring uh, a graphics, a different graphics engine into the playback portion of HVE? Mm -hmm and take yeah. advantage of it right there? Or do you write to uh, one of the exchange formats that include animation and output to that, and then they can just bring it right into the 3D program of their choice? Yeah. Um, so those are the, the types of things that I'm thinking about for the future of HVE. Uh, or do you bring HVE physics into 
one of these other uh, graphics engines. Because uh, that would be another option is you basically build a front end in a different graphics engine that you then take advantage of HV's physics. That's cool. I'm, I'm excited to see what you come up with. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds daunting, uh, but as the user, I'm I'm excited for where where things are heading. And uh, you know, a lot of the times uh, I get uh, questions from a client, and they'll say, "All right, cool. Hey, mediation's in a month. Can you get me an animation?" And the way that I think of the term animation is like this photorealistic thing that takes tens of thousands of dollars to create. Um, but at times I'll I'll just show them a high end rendering from a simulation and they're just like mind blown. They didn't even know that was possible. And it's all, you know, physics based. It's nothing that I can, you know, manipulate like you can in animation anyway and do things that are not uh, based in reality. Uh, and I think that, you know, that that's really valuable and impresses a jury, impresses a client and keeps everything uh, nice and tight so that you're not iterating between simulation and animation, which is always a bit frustrating for me because like we were talking about before recording, it's like sometimes I'll get everything done. I think I'm completely buttoned up. I'll send it out to the animator. They'll do all of their work. It's a lot of money. And then I'll realize one thing that I didn't like that I want to change and they've got to do right. a lot more work to get that done. So the more that can stay in simulation land, the happier, the happier I am anyway. There's definitely been this move in the last uh, few years to make it easier to go from simulation to a really nice looking um, visualization. Um, whether it's, you know, virtual crash or PC crash with their capabilities of bringing in point clouds um, and rendering right from yeah. inside the simulation software. In HVE, you can improve the graphics if you take the time to uh, add textures to things. Like you can really get decent graphics with with textures. Um, the next major version of HVE will add shadows, and it's uh, hard to believe how important that is. <laughs> shadows add a level of realism that you don't realize you're missing until you see something with shadows, and then you're like, oh, you know, yep. because. Th then when you see it without shadows, you're like, I can't tell if it's floating or not, you know? And it's like, yeah, uh, the shadows really ground the vehicle. So. Oh, cool. Yeah. I look forward to that. And is it possible, how difficult would it be? And is it on the horizon to bring in like an environmental point cloud that is not interacting with any of the physics, but is just there to facilitate rendering? Is that feasible? You can bring point clouds in to HVE. It's, Right now, it's not easy. That's the the one uh, difficulty is you have to convert it to a point set in the in the uh, VRML format, and then you can import it. Um, and physics will ignore it. Uh, okay, but it it'll um, it you know you can create a decent looking um, scene. We have to work on. Uh, how the points are handled visually. So, you know, you're aware in the other programs, there may be, depending on how far away you are from a point, it shows up as a different size. Um, so that's something that we have to work on on our end is that they don't look the same. They're not the same size when you're a thousand feet away as they are when you're 50 feet away. Um, because then when you're 50 feet away, it might look great. You're a thousand feet away. You can't see anything because it's so tiny. So there, yeah. there has to be a level of, of detail to, based on your camera position. Um, the one thing I did notice in the in the version that we had uh, with shadows is that the, the point clouds can actually cast shadows, which is mm. interesting. Yeah, that sounds cool. That sounds uh, computationally yeah. intense, but yeah, but uh, it works. So it's interesting. yeah, that's awesome. Uh, yeah. so I wanted to talk a little bit. So uh, you're obviously still, you're heading up HVE and a EDC. That sounds like a huge undertaking. And then you've got all the publications going on and then you have Momenta. So you're, you're doing consulting work still. Uh, you're doing HVE of course, and balancing those two things out. But with your consulting work, what is your, what's your current toolkit look like? It's, uh, it sounds like you're saying you don't do a lot of drone work and things like that. 
Um, but I'm curious, just what, what, what do you have in your kit as far as scanners, uh, cameras, uh, video cameras and, and things like that? What do you find yourself kind of leaning on the most? So I have a drone, but I just, the, the number of, um, site inspections, I guess that I would be doing is, is, is less than it would have been say four years ago. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just flew my drone last week. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, it's still yeah. fresh. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a Trimble X seven, which oh, nice. I love. Yeah. yeah. I've done some testing with that thing and have been very impressed. I have a little BLK 360, the original version, not which impressed. I know you I am not impressed at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so we'll have to talk about this in, in more detail, uh, sometime later, but one of the things that I do with the BLK is I put it up on a, um, 16 foot tripod shelf like a shelf maybe and just let people know you have it but <laughs> uh, oh, it does look I, good uh, I, 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 I get it up on a on a 16 foot tripod that's cool yeah where i'm not afraid if my blk uh happens to fall it's not because the same it's as useless the yes i get it <laughs> i'm kidding uh, i'll stop bashing on it now Leica yeah. makes really good stuff that's just not one of the things that's good for like scanning cars or anything like that but well so i i think that's the key is that if you're using it for scanning cars for example that in the way that you're doing it to create yeah. a um you know a point cloud that captures details of the vehicle then it's not going to be the tool for that now can it capture a crushed vehicle certainly because I, you know i was using a tape measure before and i can right. guarantee you it does better than a tape measure yeah um, so no but i'm sorry i interrupted so you put it up high and you're using yeah. that generally speaking at uh at collision sites and that allows you to get a nice angle of incidence between the the beam and the roadway so you're capturing yeah. a lot of good data yes it it does a lot better and it's it's fast now i have the original one so what was fast when that came out is no longer fast because now the rtc 360 is lightning fast the trimble is lightning fast so you can yeah. um now the new blk which i'd like to to test out just to see how it does is like 10 times faster than those apparently it oh, can wow. do a full 360 scan in under a minute with photos so holy cow but it doesn't have the reach you know, um, and that's what I'm interested in just seeing how well it, how well it does. But, you know, if you don't have the reach, but you can get a hundred more scans in, maybe it doesn't. Yeah, matter, exactly. Know? If they're a minute long, that's, that's cool. And that thing's so small, it can go in, you know, foot wells and all sorts of tiny little plates underneath. If you're looking at the reinforcement beam and a low speeder or something like that, and you want to just put it on the ground yeah, and, and, and maybe get the, uh, aluminum beam. Yeah. I'll give you some examples. Uh, you're you're in a busy on a busy roadway pedestrian traffic vehicles on the side of the road you can't get out into the roadway but you could get your blk 16 20 feet up in the air and scan from up there it doesn't matter if there's vehicles parked on the side of the road you know because you can get over top of them and you can still see the roadway so that's one area that's nice uh, the other is <laughs> I mounted on my truck, my pickup truck that has a roof rack and I mounted on the back left corner on the roof rack and I can drive on the side of the highway, stop, start my scanner up for my iPad, scan, drive 50 feet, scan, That's drive awesome. 50 feet, scan. Yeah. That's so there's brilliant. times where you may not be able to, um, to get a good scan just due to traffic. For example, New York City, there's times where you just can't get a good you know, you can't stop and scan you on the you have pedestrians everywhere, but I can pull along the side of the road park and scan from, from the top of my truck. Uh, yeah. what would be nice is to have one of those poles that comes up. I can get it like, you know, yeah, like a high. news anchor or something. That would be really yeah. cool. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And you know, as much crap as I'm giving the BLK, it's obviously the fit, the fit and finish, the size, uh, the form is fantastic. Like yeah. is obviously a very reputable company. The price is right. It's just like, you, you don't want to sh you don't want to scan anything that's shiny or dark with that. It's best for interiors with white walls or outside. Yeah. And it seems it sounds like it does a good job capturing the roadway. Yeah, it does. Okay. On the roadway about, uh, so probably, you get it maybe like 50 feet 
Okay. You know, that like after 50 feet, you just start to lose data in, yeah. in the gray roadway. It'll pick up the white lines much further. But yep. if you're trying to actually capture the, the asphalt, it doesn't have the reach that the other devices will, will have. Um, the Trimble X7 is is great. I know you tested it. Um, it does. It does well. It does really well. Uh, yeah, and like it's fast thing. and it's rugged and it's waterproof, which is nice. Um, yeah. Whatever waterproof. Um, yeah. IP 54 or whatever the heck it is. Yeah. yeah. So, and, and so how long have you had that? Um, about a year. Yeah. It was about the time I think that you had tested yours is around that same time you tested okay. one when you did the, the round Robin, I guess, or whatever you want to call it with the, L, the RTC, the Pharaoh and the, and the trim. Yeah. I which, still have to publish that. It, it makes oh, me excellent. so sad. I've, I've written it. It's sitting there. It's just waiting for like a content editor to go through everything and fix some grammar and make sure that it's not so boring that nobody will want to read it. That's generally how I write. Just very matter of fact. <laughs> yeah. But well, uh, I, yeah. I, I found it fascinating because they all did those three. You did the Pharaoh. I forget which one, but you did the RTC 360 and the X7. Yeah. And they all did did well. Yeah, they all did really well. They're all good tools. The RTC yeah. is like, if you have the money, it's the best tool. It's very clear, but it's twice as expensive as the X7 essentially. So, And what I found interesting was that the X7, I think if I remember you did a Tesla with it, which has the glass roof or whatever. Yeah. And the X7 did better on the roof, but not on the interior. The, and the, the RTC did like yeah. really well in the interior and it's kind of like well, why like yeah it's an interesting find no, that was really strange and i talked to trimble about that to their credit they were very interested in what happened with the interior because that tesla had that black pleather and but it was a gray tesla with glass roof so i'm with you it's like okay if you can get the glass roof you'd think the seats would be easier than that but they were essentially yeah. vacant yeah it's weird um, it is weird. So, and then, so what are you using for, uh, for a camera right now? I know mirrorless is all the rave. I have not switched over. I'm still using a Nikon D750 and it's just tried and true and the battery lasts long and it focuses well. So, uh, where do you fall in that camp? So I have a Nikon, uh, I have an older Nikon D7000. I have a Sony AS7 II. Oh, nice. Um, and that's for a lot of your video, video work, I imagine. Yeah, video and and if there's any nighttime type applications, the um, the A7S's two, one, two, three have a um, a superior sensor for for capturing in the low low light levels. Yeah, I've been very impressed with that. That's actually what I'm recording this with right now, and then we'll go out and use it whenever. We have a 50 millimeter fixed lens so that we can go out and try to recreate what the human eye is seeing to the best of our ability. But like I said, if it gets too complex and it's a nighttime thing, then we'll hire you and Sue, and I won't try yeah. it. Yeah, the, the, um, so that I have that camera. I have, well, I have way too many cameras. Um, you know, one of the – you you had asked – some questions, some, uh, that you were going to go through. I'm going to answer one right now because, uh, it was, what was, uh, under 5,000, I think. What was the question? Yeah. You can pick the yes. number kind of, but I figure in recon, that's a good number to get a lot of, uh, it's like, what's your best investment under 5,000 or the best tool you bought under 5,000. Yeah. So I'll answer that. Um, it's, it's this, this guy right here. I, I, Apple, yeah, the 13 or whatever it's, it is. The iPhone is the best tool under yeah. 5,000. Uh, yeah. It's an incredible camera. It shoots macro. It shoots incredible video. You can do slow-mo video. Um, yeah. It has an accelerometer built in, a GPS built in. If I'm on a scene and I can't get access to some program that I have because I'm logged out, I can set up a hotspot, log back in. Uh, so by far, that has been probably the best tool under 5,000 that that I have. And it doesn't have to be an iPhone. It could be what your, your yeah. phone of choice, but um, it's been huge. So as far as cameras go, uh, it's one of my favorite cameras. And you always have it with you, which is great. You know, that's yeah, the best exactly. camera. The best camera is the one you got on. Exactly. It's so true. And I, I uh, recently upgraded, you know, one of the big motivators for me upgrading was Eugene Licio's app Recon 3D. And I don't know if you've had a chance to play around with that or any of the other similar programs, but yeah. 
with the LIDAR in there, uh, you know, it, I, I, one of the things that we used to say is just that this is like, a, it's more like a computer than anything, but now yeah. it's not because it's a computer tied with, like you were saying, all of this unique hardware in the form of yeah. GPS, LIDAR, cameras, accelerometers. So it becomes, uh, you could make this essentially as good as a V-Box if, if you have the right filtering. So I don't know, have you used the iPhone for any data acquisition, like skid testing or anything like that at this point? Not anything that was, um, you know, uh, I've played with it, I'll put it that way. But yeah. uh, I haven't used it on anything that I've needed that data for. That I, can I know there were some papers, SAE, like 2016, where some of the, yeah. I think, Kineticorp guys were looking at the sensors and comparing it to bona fide data acquisition systems uh, that are scientifically oriented and we're finding really good, a really good fit. And yeah. I went down a similar path because one of the things that I was really interested in measuring was motorcycle lean angle. And yeah. from an iPhone or the like, you will get rates, you know, roll rates, but you're not going to get the absolute roll. And when you want to get the absolute role, then it requires high-end filtering, which is essentially not going to be paired to any of these apps. You have to go to something a lot more big league. So I think the sensors that in these things are just as good as a lot of the other sensors that we're dealing with. It's just about the filtering. So if you can export to MATLAB or something like that and apply your own filter right. um, or find an app where they have already done that legwork and it's like, you know, apps are ridiculous. They're like, yeah, well, it's six bucks for this one. And we're like, oh, right. gosh, six bucks. How dare I know. you? Yeah. I know. <laughs> Like when, uh, when anybody's charging more than 50, it's like, what? This must be the yeah. best app ever. Exactly. How much work must they put into this? Yeah. Uh, all right. So they, I think that tie, ties up the, the, tool, the tool section. I think it's cool for people to hear what uh, heavy hitters like you are using as they're working up a crash. Obviously, you have a lot of software tools, too. So, well, uh, also on the camera front, I have a Garmin 360 that I, with the Verb, mm. that yeah. I love. Um, I mount that outside of my, my vehicle and then record 360. And what's great is it also interface, you know, it has a GPS, so it, it'll track your speed. You can actually interface with your ODB2 if you want. You can, uh, you can get speed data and things off of your vehicle. So anybody who's not familiar with Garmin's uh, cameras, you should look into them, the Verb cameras. Dang, and so is the OBD2 just being streamed via Bluetooth to the Verb? So I, I don't have that access, but you can get a connector to connect Jeez. it to your ODB2 and then yeah, and then transfer it. That's crazy. Yeah, yeah it's pretty pretty interesting. I think it is a Bluetooth OD, ODB2 connection. Actually, I have one that I used to use with my phone, but uh, I haven't used that in mm. a while. But just the fact that it captures GPS is great. I mean, you get vehicle speed. So even if you're not going to use that as your video, like you're going to shoot your, you know, with your Sony or some other video camera, um, if you also have that running, now you have uh, GPS data that you can then tie to your other video, which is nice. Um, so I use it in that way, even if I'm shooting video with with a different camera. I use um, I brought some some toys to show. Oh, nice. Uh, I love show so, and tell. Yeah. So this is a Z mm. stereo camera. That is that Intel or? No, they're their own stereo labs, I think is who makes it. Um, okay. And so I got this years ago uh, when I was experimenting with um, using um, SLAM, uh, simultaneous localization and, oh, what is it, modeling maybe? So it's, I don't know if you're familiar with SLAM technology, but it, it's used in robotics mainly. Um, it, it can track where something's moving by using r the images in a, in a video. Um, Makes sense. I mean, there's two cameras. They know the characteristics of them. They know how far they are from each other. And then yeah. it's essentially like human eyes. Yeah. So it builds a three-dimensional world as the robot goes through the world. Jeez. So you could use it in a similar way to create a point cloud of, of a vehicle, just, you know, using this and going around yeah. it. Um, now, of course, I think that's what dot product is doing uh, at a, bo uh, at a Boston. Yeah. And they're using Intel's stereo camera like that and then just hooking it up to a droid iPad, uh, whatever, a, a droid tablet and in doing that. And the data looks really good and it's a low cost solution. So could you yeah. hook that to a car, like suction cup it to the roof and drive through a scene and get a point cloud? Or is that too big? 
I've, I've tried it on scenes and it's worked okay, but I don't, you know, now you use your drone or you use your scanner. Yeah. Um, I still use it to capture stereo imagery though. Sometimes like if I'm driving through a scene and, and, you know, when that could be important, maybe, you know, if, if it matters to have stereo imagery, now they're new, the new one has the, the lens is a little closer so that it mimics more the human eye. These are a little far apart. Um, so could you then just put that into like an Oculus Rift or some sort of headset and be looking at things realistically? Oh, nice. There we go. Yeah. Nice. So, you know, other questions like what's the future? What are we going to be doing in the future? Um, I think that virtual reality is somehow going to be in the future. It's just how how are we going to use it in our industry? I think that the Rift is or this is the um, Quest. The Quest is uh, gotten the price down and and um, I guess Facebook took it over or, or Meta now. Um, and so there's a lot of development in using it for training and, and things of that nature. I think it's just a matter of time until it becomes more useful in our industry. I'm not sure exactly how we would do it. Like, are we going to put a whole bunch of jurors in a in right. Quest? I don't know. But, but I do see that... that yeah, there's a potential future there. I have um, multiple uh, 360 camera setups. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, so that's like stereo imagery and 360. Same thing with that, stereo imagery and 360. Um, so that's you can beautiful. capture so... Yeah, you can capture yeah. video with that and it'll and then you could watch it back on the on the Quest and it'll be uh, 3D and stereo. Dang. Is, so yeah, then you could, it would be obviously uh, looking around. at the accelerometers in the head unit. And then, so how much are one of those 360 degree arrays? So you can spend anywhere from, you know, for 360, you can spend, this is an older one, but a thousand, you can spend 12,000. Okay. You know, the best one today is, so the problem, this is an older one. And so it, it might be 4k output in 360 that's not good enough you know you want 8k at least uh they have the twelve thousand dollar one is uh i think is 12k um Jeez, i can only imagine how big those files are yeah yeah but but when you're talking three whoop i was blurry there when you're talking 360 and stereo um you know if you imagine 4k video looks good but you need to have 4k anywhere you look to, to yeah. make it look really good. So, you know, or 1080p, like you have 1080p, but you need it everywhere you look. So you need 12K video for 360 degrees and, and both images, both eyes. Yeah. yeah, you got a lot of fun um, toys over there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's more experimenting, you know. Where, where are we going in the future? Yeah, so. which is one of the cool things that uh, I, I see you experimenting a lot. I try to experiment a lot whenever I sometimes – you know, I, I'll give up billing and I'll give up the things that I should be doing just to have a little bit of fun and start playing with things that I think might be useful down the line. Um, which kind of brings me to, I don't think, you know, this question's coming on any level, but, uh, what, so I saw on LinkedIn, uh, that you take these classes from Coursera and I, I did a little bit of research on them and it seems really cool. So it's just like you, you know, similar in a similar vein, you just continue to learn things and, um, challenge yourself. So what is that platform? What classes have you found to be beneficial on there? And do you recommend other recons to, to look into that? Yeah, absolutely. Or, or even like LinkedIn learning, I think has a lot of classes now. Um, Coursera is a lot of universities now are tied in with Coursera. And so you can take courses from, I think I took a couple from Duke university of Illinois, um, and you're actually getting the course just like a student in the class would be getting the course. It's just pre-recorded. Now, some of them you can take um, and actually get, if you want, you can sign up and get college credit for them. Um, now, the requirements is a little different in terms of your requirements to do homework and things of that nature and take tests. But if you just want to take the courses, you can get a certificate um, and they're they're great. The uh, I took the University of Illinois vehicle dynamics class was excellent. Oh, wow. And um, who taught that? Of, 
Is it somebody that we know in the community or it was, it's not like Dan Metz or something no. like that? No, it wasn't. It wasn't Dan Metz. Uh, okay. Yeah. I can't recall at this time, but, um, and then I took some courses on the, that had to do more with vision and the brain and human factors and, and things along that nature. So there was some really uh, interesting ones. I think one was at Duke, um, fascinating on, on the, the eye and vision and the brain and, and uh, how it works. And, and that and was in Duke. service, I imagine, to that, uh, those papers that you were writing and kind of looking at low light uh, visibility yeah, and but, things. Well, yeah, just in general, there was, I have this interest in vision, you know, starting with Wilmer Eye Institute coming out of there at Hopkins. It's just always been something that's interesting to me. Uh, and it plays into our field. I mean, it's, it's huge, like how we see um, and how the brain under, you know, interprets what we see. So uh, when I saw those courses were available, I was like, oh, that's perfect for continuing ed instead of some of the courses that you end up having to take that, you know, you're trying to get credit for your PE or whatever it happens to be. But I found these very interesting courses to, to take also and learn from them. So that's cool. Yeah. Well, I, I was looking through there and I think, yeah, I think I'll, I'll try to find some on there that can, uh, that'll blow my hair back and take them. It's really cool to have access to that sort of stuff. I've taken a couple of classes uh, from from MIT, just going and watching yeah, some pre recorded things. I don't get any credits or anything. It's just like, well, free education like this is uh, it's ridiculous. Unbelievable. Yeah, it's yeah. unbelievable. I was going to say MIT's that uh, you can take any course at MIT, which is unbelievable. Um, <laughs> I love it. it. Yeah, and and I I am for for younger people. <laughs> today coming out of uh, school or even going into school, you can tailor your, um, what you want to learn. It's, it's, it's a lot different because you can choose the best classes for you. You know, okay, I want to take these two courses at Duke and I want to take these two from wherever, because this professor is teaching this and this professor is teaching that you can really tailor a course load. Um, now maybe you're not getting a degree out of it. Like you said, it's more about the learning aspect as opposed to the degree. Yeah. Hey, you, you could become Will Hunting. Uh, I'll take that, you know? <laughs> How about them apples? Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. So I wanted to switch gears a little bit and kind of get into the future. We talked a little bit about it already, but where you see things heading. And I reached out to, to Eric Dial, who I used to work with and is an HVE power user and a simulation guru in general. And one of his questions, he had a bunch of very interesting questions, some of what, which we'll get into, but is regarding the short term and long term future of HVE. So what do you kind of have on your short list of things to accomplish? And then kind of looking out to a farther horizon, maybe 10, 15 years down the line, what do you think yeah. the, the platform will look like? So the short list is to try to make the uh, user interface um, to improve on the user interface, the way that the user interacts with various menus within HVE, um, the tabling system, being able to change, say you want to go in and change all the brakes on a tractor trailer, uh, instead of having to click through all of them at once, you know, being able to do things in a more global manner. So just trying to work on, on how you interact with the program. Um, and then beyond that would be, um, and I, I'm always thinking about improvements to physics and mainly in, in Simon uh, and Dimesh. And the one area where I think that um, m most of these physics programs, simulation programs, um, don't do as well as in low speed. So, you know, sub one mile per hour or something is where your tire models start to um, mm. break down, I'll say. So improving the tire models at, at the low end of the, um, the speed realm. And then also um, looking into uh, more improvement in, in low end impact modeling too. Um, you know, what I'd love to do is to, to have some testing, maybe like, you know, uh, somebody who's done a, a lot of low impact testing yeah. and start to, to um, do some validation at that end. Uh, and I know there has been some, but just more, yeah. more of that type of work. Um, yeah. Longer term, 
graphics engine. We've talked a lot about it. Um, possibly looking into uh, not being tied to a Windows platform would be nice. Um, you know, could we, That that's not as big a deal, but maybe some people want to run it on a Mac or a Linux or on the internet, you know, getting it into a cloud-based system, yeah. um, which some people would benefit from being able to just log into the computer, all the processing's done in the cloud somewhere. Um, yeah. You know, and, and then there's maybe some uh, physics applications that can be run uh, on on other types of devices. And I'm not saying all of HV on here, but there could be things because HV is obviously a, a package with physics pack, uh, physics um, programs inside of it. Uh, and so when I think of HVE, it's not just simulation. It could be other uh, tools that you may want to use in accident reconstruction. Uh, and some of those tools may be able to be run on, on your phone or on your iPad or, uh, in different areas like that. Yeah. 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 Like you're saying the, the iPhone is one of the things it's kind of like that same sentiment is the best camera is the one you have with you. The best computer, the best analytical tool is the one that you have with you. And yeah. sometimes when you're on the road, uh, it's nice to be able to, to run some quick, analyses um, while you're there to get an idea of what's going on. For me, one of the big positives to simulation that I think, um, you know, sometimes you can, you can do uh, the recon by hand and, and, or in some simple way, uh, Excel spreads, spreadsheet, something like that, but visualizing how an accident happens, it's huge. And mm -hmm. it helps when you are trying to figure out marks at a scene. And you're like, I can't figure out that mark, you know? Yep. And then you run a simulation and you're like, oh, now I know yeah. how that mark was made. You know, it's yeah. this tire or it's this, you know, something underneath maybe created that mark. It really helps you uh, visualize what's, you know, when you can watch it, then you, you then you can start to figure out, oh, these, these marks now make sense. Because sometimes you're at a scene and you'll have marks that you just, I'm not sure what made those marks, you know? Yeah, so. that describes my process. I, I'd say most of the time when I'm looking at auto v auto crashes, where there's a lot of tires involved, of course, tractor trailers too. But even if it's just two cars and you have eight tires, I'll generally go through the photogrammetric process of modeling them, building my site, building my scene in uh, virtually to bring it into some sort of simulation package without getting too married to anything yet as far as what car made what tire marks. And then I'll start running the sim and figuring out what I think is likely to have happened and then start getting an idea of, oh, those marks are coming probably from this guy. And then yeah. I'll go back to the physical evidence at the from the scene photographs or whatever I have to try to corroborate that. But it's always a back and forth for me. Yeah. Yeah, one of the, one of the um, just kind of sidebar on, on the same thing is when you have secondary slaps on vehicles, you know, like you, you have a nice impact and then the vehicles come and touch, uh, simulating that is great, you know, cause you can keep, keep simulating until you get the secondary slap in the right spot. Um, yep. just another, something that stands out to me in terms of simulation. Yeah. A little harder to do that with, with hand calcs. You know, one of the things like I, I, I teach uh, the motorcycle class and we have a rotational mechanics section where we are trying to uh, figure out how fast the motorcycle is going. You and I have talked about these calculations based on yeah. how much the target vehicle rotates. And no matter how good your hand calc model is, it's never going to be as good as a simulation model that can account for the steering angle, that can account for what the driver's doing with the brakes, that can account for the fact that these tires are going to actually rotate a little bit as the vehicle is sweeping uh, that uh, arc to final rest. You know, it, when we're doing the hand calcs, you kind of have to pick one coefficient. You're like, oh, the tires, let's call them locked, 0.7 Gs. Um, right. So the, the simulation, what you can account for, the subtleties and how sophisticated it can be, which can be daunting at times. I, I imagine, especially if you're new to it, you're looking at all these input parameters. And I remember the first time I was exposed to HV, I was just like, how, how could I ever uh, fill this out completely and confidently? But the more you use yeah. it, the better you get at it and the more comfortable you get. 
And you could perform yeah. sensitivity analyses and just say, all right, well, uh, let's assume X, Y, or Z. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think an important thing is for people to do sensitivity analysis for themselves um, to understand what effects say, like we were talking about suspension parameters before. It's like, well, okay, we'll half it, see what happens, double it, see what happens and yeah. get an idea of like what, what range actually makes a difference in what you are trying to determine. I mean, that's ultimately what the question is, is if you're trying to determine an impact speed, suspension parameters probably aren't going to matter in a vehicle to vehicle accident that much, mm. you know, but if th there are cases where they may matter. And then in those cases, you're, you just need to know that, that they have a bigger effect. Um, my answer, you know, when people ask, it's like, uh, well, you don't know all those parameters. Like if you look at the vehicle output from, from a Simon run, it's like, you don't know all those parameters. And it's like, yeah, but your 360 momentum has none of them. So yeah. if you can get an answer with no parameters, uh, you know, none of the vehicle parameters except for weight and speed, um, it, it, again, it comes back to what you're trying to determine. And sometimes those parameters won't have a big effect on the, on the ultimate, um, thing you're trying to determine, especially if it's speed in an impact. And, and we, again, we use 360 momentum and we get a, a pretty good answer. But yeah. if you're trying yeah. to look at, you know, the, how the vehicle spun out afterwards, or like you said, a motorcycle impact where you have the vehicle sliding sideways and the tire forces matter and how far did it slide and things like that. Okay. Yeah. Or my example earlier with the vehicle rolling. Yep. You know, if you're cases. trying to match that, it becomes a lot more sophisticated. And one thing that I, I try to do is, well, I think I always do this, but there, I'm sure there's cases where I haven't been able to just back up my simulation with hand calcs. And then I walk in because one of the common cross-examination questions on any simulation is garbage in, garbage out, right, Mr. Peck? And uh, I'll be able to defend via sensitivity analyses and parameter selection in general, what literature I use to get those parameters, um, or what testing I use to get those parameters. But at the end of the day, I can defend all that and then just fall back on, but my momentum analysis, if that's applicable, or my rotational mechanics analysis, which is very basic, is completely in line with this simulation. So if you want to hammer this down, then you're going to also have to hammer down my rotational mechanics analysis. And uh, that's going to be a little bit difficult for you to do, I think, because it's based on simple Newtonian physics. Right, right. Um, all right, cool. Well, uh, so we were talking about low poly modeling, and this is probably a good time to talk about it. We um, at at Lightpoint, of course, we have like 800 point cloud models that we've been developing over the past couple of years. And then when Tony and I hooked up a couple of years ago and started talking more to each other, realizing both of us, I think, wanted an, a way to make low poly meshes uh, to... Uh, be implemented in our simulation platforms and 3D graphics rendering platforms. And we kind of put our heads together to try to figure out how to make that happen. And you were instrumental in finding the right people and developing the process. Um, so if, if you want to talk a little bit about that, kind of where we are, where we're going and what that process has looked like. Um, I'll give Matt his, his due. Matt Blackwood um, is instrumental in this process, but um, basically going from a point cloud to a low poly model uh, seems like it should be easy, you know, and, yeah, but it's not. It does. Um, yeah. I mean, even um, meshing a point cloud it, in itself can be, I mean, you can do it in cloud compare, you can do it in um, other programs and, um, but you'll get a very dense mesh because the, the point clouds are, are dense uh, typically. Uh, so you have a lot of, uh, information there. And it's normally not as, um, I mean, you can get really nice looking models, but, uh, they're not as useful for, uh, say like HVE, um, Dimesh where you want a low poly model. You don't want a lot of, um, a lot of vertices cause it'll really slow the program down. Uh, so low poly modeling, I think is, is going to be huge. Uh, talking about, you know, the future, I think it's also huge for, other uh, real-time rendering engines like Unreal and, and Unity, which they're rendering on the fly that, you know, where we were talking earlier about Blender and Cycles, where you can render, it might take three minutes or eight minutes or a half hour to render one frame, depending on how many times you want that light to bounce around. Real-time rendering happens 
real time. Uh, and so game engines. That's crazy. Yeah. They need to do it, you know, 60 frames per second to get something that, or 30 frames per second, whatever. But, you know, normally it's going to be like 60 frames per second. You're rendering 60 frames per second and it looks really good. And the way that they do that is with low poly modeling and really nice texturing. So it looks great. The underlying model is is accurate. Well, our goal is for the underlying yeah. model to be to be accurate, which is where the point clouds come in. Um, and you know, so we're starting with a with a uh, with an accurate measure documentation of a vehicle, and then we want to create a model that's going to be useful in our industry, so that you can defend it if asked upon. You know, about it in court. It's like, well, where'd you get that model from? Uh, well, it came from. A, a point cloud and and here's the yeah. documentation and the and the low poly model is based on that point cloud and here's the overlay that shows that it matches it's dimensionally yeah. correct so and those yeah, are I two gaps that, that we've never huge. been able to really like it's a it's a we've never been able to really bridge those two things where it's uh we know that it is a scientifically sound model as far as the measurements go and we're also getting low poly straight out of the gate where even if you go yeah. to Turbo Squid and buy something that may or may not be accurate to the true dimensions, oftentimes it's just there's too many polys to make it useful. So you have to spend a lot of time whittling it down. So hopefully by getting both of those taken care of, and then of course you've developed methods so that it's going to be delivered in a format that is instantly uh, integrated into all of these different platforms, virtual crash, PC crash, HVE, um, M smack 3d and right. any just general CAD program like blender. Right. Yeah, exactly. Or it's if gonna be you want to use it in, in, in unreal engine or unity, or like you said, 3d studio max, it'll work in any program. So. Yeah. You think I remember like when we first started dealing with point clouds, maybe 10 years ago, and we thought that that would be easy. We're like, well, in a year or two, somebody will have a, you know, you just push the button and the point cloud becomes a 3d mesh and off you go. Um, still has not happened. It's still, you know, Matt is, it's uh, a largely manual process to get everything done. He's just excels at it and is able to do it very quickly and has developed processes to help him speed things along. But they're, yeah. they're beautiful looking models and I'm looking forward to getting those out there and well, using them myself. A lot of my entrepreneurial ventures within recon are just scratching my own itch. <laughs> just like, well, I, I want this. So, uh, let's yeah. make it happen. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well that, that's my, you know, talking about changes to HVE, that's, that's half of it. It's like when I find something that I find annoying, it's like, I, I need to fix this. You know, yeah, I want to change. Exactly. So it's the same idea and which is, that. yeah, well, I, I'm sure why Terry was thought it was really important to bring a user in to, to take it yeah. over. If you brought somebody from outside the community, they would not know the pains and what needs development. Um, and I think we touched on this one. One of the things that I wanted to talk about, um, but it kind of goes to Blender and HVE and the potential integration of those is, do you think it's possible in the future we're going to have an all-in-one tool that we can use for photogrammetry, that we can use for CAD, that we can use for rendering, that we can use for simulation and just have that all under one umbrella? That's definitely um, possible in the future. So, so Blender is is kind of that all in one tool, except for the physics aspect of it, right? Um, Virtual Crash is is a pretty you know, or even PC Crash. I mean, HVE, MSMAC 3D, they they all do um, the the you know part of the graphics. Virtual Crash, you can bring in point clouds, which is great. But you can't do the photogrammetry stuff. You can't maybe do all the video editing type things. You can't do the motion tracking. Blender is a, an amazing tool because it can do all of that. The question that, and I've thought a lot about using HV physics in a way, because Blender has its own physics too. Right? It has rigid body physics. It has soft body dynamics. It has computational fluid dynamics. You know, there's lots of physics that you can work with inside of Blender. Um, and you can program, it's open source, so you can program for it all day. I mean, somebody made a um, fracture uh, add-on where you can basically fracture a building, you know, and it, and it crumbles down. I mean, there, there's like some really cool tools that have been made for Blender. The, the one unique thing that 
I haven't figured out how to do where HVE shines is we it's built and, and this is goes to tear it. it. It's built based on, you know, the, the matrix, human vehicle environment, event playback. You, you add a human, you add vehicles, you add an environment in the event, you can add multiple events and use different vehicles. And then in playback, you can combine all of those. And what's, what's nice is inside one program, you can have your event, you can have what if scenarios all in one, one file. Uh, and that's, that's pretty powerful when you want to do what if scenarios and say, okay, here's my simulation. Now I want to see what if this guy was going 50 instead of uh, seven. Okay. Copy the event, change it to, to 50 run it, see what happens. You know, what if you steered different? What if you break, you know, you can do those all in one file and it's because of the way it's laid out in these compartments. And the question is, is that these other, um, game engines and, and, or, or like graphic, like a blender, which is a, you know, a 3d program, it's not made for that. You know, you'd have to build a front end to it to utilize that sort of mentality, which is, you know, I want to have a list of of objects and their humans. I want a list of objects and their vehicles that can be used in my simulation. I've thought a lot about this though, because what would be really cool in a program like Blender or 3D Studio Max or any of these programs is if you had uh, nodes that were your physics nodes and you had objects that you could define and you say, okay, the, these are the objects that I want to go into this Simon or EdSmack 4 physics node. And then there's an output that comes out of that node um, but you can have all kinds of other things in the scene that are completely ignored by physics. So you can have some really high end, oh, cool yeah. looking stuff in your scene that you're not send. You're not even sending to physics. Yeah. It's um, just being handled by the CAD program, which is already fully yeah. built up. Dude, that'd be, yeah. that, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Make but, it happen, Tony. Make it happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the, but to me, I, I, I've, I've thought a lot about this, this process of how we, how we create events and can create multiple events and then combine them in post, you know? So yeah. I don't know if blender is the right tool, but, but for me, obviously you, you know, the, everybody realizes I love blender, uh, as a tool. Yeah. I think it's very useful. The HV is my number one tool. Uh, um, you know, blender is my number two tool. Um, yeah. So for, if, if I could combine the best of both worlds, that would be amazing. You know, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's what it sounds like to me, too. I'm just thinking about that from the way that I currently handle things. And the more I can stay in one program, the smoother everything becomes. And right now, my the work horse of my photogrammetry projects is absolutely photo modeler. Um, but there's a few things that they're not doing on the CAD side that I'd really like to see them do. And to their credit, they're very open to it. So I'll probably call them and have these conversations and see if they can do that. Um, but for instance, you know, just moving a point cloud around in photo modeler until it aligns with the corresponding pixels of the f f uh, surveillance frame or something like that would be yeah. hugely beneficial. Um, but it sounds like, you know, maybe removing distortion in photo modeler and figuring out the camera parameters and then just going into blender from there and handling the rest it would be a great workflow yeah and i'll, I'll have to look but i think that there may be an an add-on that brings in i can't remember if it is photo modeler but there may be an add-on that'll bring in the photo modeler cameras and everything yeah the add-ons are extreme for blender from what i've been seeing which is awesome and then one of the cool things about photo modeler as well is what you can export for a lot of very specific cad programs like rhino yeah. and i think you can there might also be a blender export so that it's export. all scripted and ready to just bring it right into blender yeah uh, and then what about integration of edr data of course we're getting all this pre-impact data now we get five seconds of pre-impact data generally at two hertz or something like that have you considered making just an input table? So it's like, all right, here's what the EDR says, and that can just be run in a sim. So you hit play, and it's taking those inputs and turning it into a dynamics situation simulation. Yeah, so uh, this I've gone back and forth on this one. Um, 
because users definitely want it. Um, actually, I, I think we just got a question this week and, you know, and, and throughout the last couple of years, it's come up where people want to enter speed versus time because that's what you get in your EDR data. Um, and we can do that. I could create a, a package where you could enter in speed versus time and it would then figure out where the vehicle needs to be using um, physics. You just have to integrate, you know, you're just calculating position based on the speed. Um, I just have to think of how we would do it. The problem with that is you have to, the user needs to understand that if they're entering in speed versus time, they, they're saying the speed is, is correct, is accurate, you know? So, so it's on the user to make sure they're using it correctly because your EDR data, the speed may not be correct. And the nice thing about simulating it and entering in a throttle and braking to try to match speed versus time on a roadway that you've built is you may find that there is something wrong, you know, mm -hmm. like your speed may not be accurate. And especially when you have a lot of braking, the speeds probably yeah. under predicted quite a bit. Yep. So, so that's the advantage of simulating is that you, you'll see those differences. Whereas if you, if you had a lot of braking, but you just entered in the speed directly, your positions will be, will be off. But again, if the user's, it, you're putting it on the user to say, look, you, you need to understand that when you do this, you're, you're forcing physics in a way, you know, yeah. you're, you're no longer it, yeah. using higher model at that point. So, yeah. Yeah. I would say th there's the, the HV, the, the driver model, right. Uh, where that you currently have, where you could say, uh, I've never really used it. I always go back to the driver tables. Um, yeah. So you're probably going to do a much better job explaining it than I ever would. But you can essentially take the car and say, go from here to there. Here's your general speed profile. Like fill out the driver tables to make that happen. Could you do something like that? Well, first of all, did I describe that right? Second of all, could you maybe do something like that to fill out the EDR table? So the driver model, it, it, it's as you described right now, the way it works is you place vehicles and then it creates a spline. And then the, the driver is trying to stay on that spline through steering. And you can also then tell it speeds at certain positions and it's trying to hit those speeds and it'll use throttle and braking to try to hit those speeds. So it's trying to act like a driver and it's got to look, it's looking forward at the spline to say, you know, what do I need to do now to get there at the right speed and, and position? Yep. Um, and it's position based though. It's, it's looking forward. It's not time based and people want time based because that's what they get there from the EDR. Uh, so I'm not, th I've thought about that. Like if you put in, um, speeds and times, and then we try to figure out the throttle and braking to hit those speeds and times. And if it's not possible, it won't happen, which is the way the driver model works. If you put in certain positions and it's not possible to hit those physically, it won't hit them physically um, because, you know, maybe the vehicle slides out or it just can't accelerate up to whatever, you know, you put it here and a hundred feet later, it's zero and then it's a hundred miles per hour. And it's like, well, I can't get yeah. to that. You know, it'll, yeah. it'll max out the acceleration, but it'll only get to the speed that it's capable of getting to. So there's a possibility there of using speed and time and trying to calculate the throttle and braking and steering necessary to, to hit your points. So it's an interesting thing though, because we have speed versus time and we have steering versus time. So obviously you can enter in the steering versus time directly. Like that part's easy. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I've even played around with it where, you know, we can create a model where you, I give you a speed table instead of a throttle table, I give you a speed table and you enter in yeah. the speed versus time and you can still put in steering. Yeah. So the vehicle will drive the U velocity, you know, the forward velocity will match the speed that you enter in the speed table, but your steering inputs will still allow the vehicle to steer because it still is calculating tire forces and slip angles and steering the vehicle. That would be the ideal situation. And it is doable. The struggle I'm having is giving that capability um, with how do we, put it out there, but with the understanding that, look, you need to make sure that if you are entering in a speed here, you understand that that's, 
you're saying that that's the speed. It's it's going to hit that speed exactly because you're putting it in there. Yeah, you know, it's not gonna. It you could put in a speed of zero and then a half second later put a speed of a hundred and that vehicle go it'll go from zero to a hundred and a half second. You know. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, I guess, so I, I've done that a lot too, with uh, a similar process with photogrammetry where we're looking at a video, we pull out keyframes, we know what the position of each of the vehicle is in each keyframe. And then we go into simulation and try to hit that. And it requires you to develop a certain speed curve. And then you're like, well, that requires a, you know, a braking rate of 1.4 G's or something. And there's no way that that right. happens. So something's wrong. Something's got to give. So I wonder if even just giving the user an output that says, here's your acceleration curve for that speed profile, please make sure it makes sense before right. you go That's commit a good to idea. it. Yeah, um, th that, that way they at least have a check, you know, yeah. where we say, look, yeah. that seems a little bit out of the ordinary. So Yes, which HV you, has told me many times, you know, hey, this is outside of the range of what, uh, are you sure you <laughs> want to do that? <laughs> Especially when I'm building motorcycles in HV, you know? Yeah, yeah. Are you sure you're running an internal combustion engine or do you have rockets on that car? Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, that's the good fun stuff. And then, so, I mean, I would, cons I'd consider you a bit of a futurist and I think that you uh, solidified my idea by pulling up three uh, different, uh, two, two 360 cameras and uh, a headset. So, yeah have you put any thought into AI and how it might be either? I mean, there's obviously, I think a lot of people are afraid. I'm, I'm not personally one of them at this point that it's just going to obliviate the need for schmucks like us at all. I think it's more of something that is going to, to help us and maybe take away some of the, the power, but have you considered the need for power? I'm sorry, just like supplement our judgment with computational power is what I meant by that. Um, what's your take? Have you put a lot of thought into that? And how do you think AI is going to integrate into recon over the next decade? So I'll start with, I think on the driving front with autonomous vehicles, um, AI is used there because those vehicles have to learn how to drive in situations that they've never seen before. Right. And the way that they teach vehicles how to drive is through deep, deep learning, you know, AI um, and I'm no, by no means an expert in this, but I do know that they're trained on certain situations and then the vehicle will see something that is not what it's ever seen before, but it knows how to respond to it. Cause there's no way for an autonomous vehicle to have seen everything before. Right. Um, and so the, the training that goes into that is interesting to me. Because one way that you could train a vehicle is to give it simulations. And so that could be an area for, for uh, work in the future is that we have simulation programs that we can create um, uh, samples to then teach the autonomous vehicles. So then the question is, well, can we do that with crash reconstruction? Can we pr create enough crash scenarios to train a system to be able to look at certain inputs to then say, well, based on these inputs, there's a certain probability that this, this is the, the outcome. What we want to do is the reverse, which is to say, here's an outcome. Can we then go back and figure out what the input is? Um, you know, it seems like, oh, wow, that's, that sounds crazy, but you know, 10 years ago, we thought a lot of things that are happening today are, are kind of like unbelievable. When you see like the deep fakes with video and the chatbot stuff that's happening now, where it's, you know, yeah. uh, the, the art that's being created on the fly that that's all AI based. Um, I know in the medical industry, they're using it for diagnosed, you know, diagnosing um, various conditions based on imagery. Um, so I imagine that there will be some way that it comes into our industry uh, as far as will this um, get rid of us as <laughs> the need for for experts uh, and and applies this applies to you know if AI gets to that point but also just with autonomous vehicles in general like if we have autonomous vehicles 
um, what do they need us for? And it's the same thing happened, you know, 20 years ago when EDR came out. It's like, oh, they're not going to need us anymore because yeah. everything has electronic data now. And it's like, well, they need us more because now we have to analyze the electronic data. And now video, all these vehicles yep. have video. And it's like, oh, well, you know, you have video, you don't need people. Well, now you have to analyze the videos. And it's so I see it as just maybe changing um, the, you know, the areas that people will be focusing on in the future. Um, you know, when we started off in this industry, we probably didn't think we'd be doing motion tracking of videos and analyzing videos as, as a regular thing. Yep. And now I would say it's probably 50% of accidents, if not more that have video in some way, either a surveillance camera or onboard video. And it's got to be close to every accident has electronic data. I mean, it's, it's got to be real close to that, where if, if you don't have electronic data, it's probably because you didn't get to the vehicle fast yeah, enough. You know? Exactly. So, uh, yeah. That's so true. And that, that is a, that's a good point. I mean, I, I voiced my opinion already. Uh, maybe I, I'm sure I didn't, uh, predispose you to any judgments you've already made, but the, the sentiment that AI is going to take over the need for recons. I, I just, I, I don't see that happening. Um, you know, like you said, when you got the EDR data, it became more work. When I get a video now, I'm with you. It's like 50, 50 of the cases I have video on and it just results in more work for me because now I can answer the questions in more detail, but to do that, I have to analyze these videos. And I think that's what's going to happen. We're going to have vehicle data reports essentially from these autonomous vehicles. And it's going to be instead of 15 pages with five seconds of pre-impact data, it's going to be 150 pages and you're going to have to go through all of that. But uh, I think it's a really good point uh, that you brought up about kind of training systems. And if you can feed it enough collision scenes, photographs from collision scenes, videos from collision scenes, and it can start to identify what gouges look like and tire marks look like and scrapes look like and final rest in the, the grade of the roadway and say, well, considering everything I see here, these tire marks, these gouges, these final rest positions. And, oh, I scanned that car. I see that that's a 2040 Toyota Camry. And I know that that weighs 3,210 pounds. Uh, well, they're probably going 30 to 35 pre-impact. That doesn't seem that yeah. far-fetched considering what we're seeing right now with chat GPT. Um, so I, it'll be interesting to see how that develops. Yeah. I mean, but even if you get a response like that from a system, then some, then you'll have to analyze that response. Like you, you'll still have to look at it and be like, okay, this is what the AI gave us. And then now let's review that and interpret it and make sure that it did, it did it correctly. Yeah. That's a really good point. Like this, we're a forensic group, you know, this is going yeah. to court. This is to, determine whether somebody should be behind bars at times or whether somebody yeah. is uh, uh, entitled to a certain amount of money. It's not like they're just going to let the, well, we'll see, I guess. But right now it seems far fetched that they would just let the, uh, AI make a determination and then make a ruling based on that. But yeah, it may help us get to a solution, which, you know, like it'll provide yeah. enough information. Then you can take that and say, okay, now I'm going to use that and see if it, if it plays forward in the appropriate way, you know? Yeah. And now that um, we're talking about it, I guess I could see that helping people at the beginning of the case, yeah. uh, when they're trying to determine whether or not it should be settled or whether or not criminal activity ensued It's just like run it through this. And if it's very clear one way or the other, then maybe we don't hire a recon and spend all that money. Yeah. Um, so we'll see uh, along those lines, you would have thought video would have done that. Right. That's yeah. It, and I wonder it there sure as heck doesn't seem like there's fewer cases right now because there's video. Um, I suspect every once in a while, somebody's dash cam shows that they were uh, smoking a cigarette and eating a McGriddle simultaneously with no hands on the wheel and attorneys okay. see that and just end it <laughs> right there. But for the most part, um, yeah, it does not seem to have affected things. And on that same note, kind of uh, some of this might have already been answered in your prior question, but have you put any thought into how you think autonomous vehicles in general will affect the recon industry? What will our recons look like in 10 years, 20 years from now? If I guess this is another baked in assumption that I don't want to make, but if a major portion of the vehicles on the roadway are uh, fully self-driving. 
One thing that I think will be interesting is, it, it, are we going to allow a mix of vehicles? Like, are we going to allow a huge fleet of autonomous vehicles and then continue to allow people to run non-autonomous vehicles? It's, it's interesting because yeah. if you went full autonomous and the vehicles could communicate with each other, I think things would, would be different. But as long as you still have people driving on the road, you're still going to have a potential for the human at that's in control of the vehicle to, to make a mistake and get in an accident. If the autonomous vehicle gets in an accident, which we've seen already where that's happening, then it's just a different level of, of investigation, right? Cause now the question becomes, well, what programming went into that? What, what is it? How, how come it responded the way it did? Did it respond appropriately? Should it have responded differently? Um, and then you're at a manufacturing level, you know, which I think, right. again, it's just going to be, it, it, it's similar to airbag deployments, you know, it's like, well, the airbag didn't go off and it's like, okay, well, was it supposed to go off? That's the first question, you know? And it's like, okay, well you, you check and it's like, well, it never got the, the signal to say deploy. So it did what it was supposed to do. So there's not like a manufacturing defect on the airbag itself where it didn't deploy because it was never told to deploy. Then the question is, should it have been told to deploy? That's a, to me a whole different question. That question is, well, the algorithm that's in there said it wasn't. So then you have to go, if you think it should have, you'd have to go to the manufacturer and be like, you know. We think I know algorithm. better than you. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Show me your algorithm. And yeah. I, I don't think you, I, yeah, Lupec don't think you designed a good airbag algorithm. Right. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. But yeah, that's yes, a really but, great analogy. That's, that's, that yeah. is the analogy. It's just going to be a lot more of those because those cases, right. I mean, I think we've all gotten the call and you're like, well, yeah, it hit a pole and it center punched a pole and the accelerometers right. didn't see the same pulse. Um, but yeah, a lot of those. So it's going to get to that product liability level a lot of the time you will absolutely yeah. in my opinion in those cases need a multidisciplinary effort to come after them you're going to need a really good recon and then probably some electro electrical engineer computer engineer somebody who understands the algorithms and the related sensors um and then that kind of like there's not going to be any mediocre recons going after tesla it's going to be an elite group i imagine who have those skills and are tried and true. Yeah. And I, I always like when you see these Tesla cases or any case where like when I see it, I always think to myself, would a human have done better? Mm -hmm. Like that's, I, I'm always wondering that because it's like, Oh, the Tesla hit a, a pedestrian that ran out in front of the Tesla. It's like, okay, well, could it have avoided? Could a human have avoided like, that's a question that I always ask myself yeah. is, is cause I imagine that at some point the cars, I mean, just like they do with ABS or, or other systems, like they perform better than humans, you know, like in terms of reaction times and things like that, the cars are faster. Uh, and I think with autonomous vehicles, it, like it's so new to us that we, when one gets in an accident, it's, it's a huge deal. Um, but the question is, is it something else that was completely unavoidable and it wouldn't have mattered if a human was driving or not, you know, it, it didn't matter that it was autonomous. Yeah. It was going to get in that accident regardless. Now, if it's just driving down the road and all of a sudden it goes off the road and runs into something, then the question is, okay, what, what failed in there? You know, what, what failed? And that's a different, that's a, a completely different question. But, you know, like if you roll a ball out in front of a Tesla, I imagine it's going to hit the ball if it only has, you know, two tenths of a second yeah. to, to do something, you know? So, yeah, exactly. That, uh, I talked with Jeff Mutart for a bit a about that specifically. And that was his same sentiment yeah. is that there's gotta be a lot of effort geared towards comparing what the autonomous systems can do com to what humans can do. And right now he sees that as a big gap in the communities in that the auto manufacturers are not really up to speed on what the human literature suggests is doable. So they're not necessarily making valid comparisons at this point. And that's something that, that he wants to work on. Yeah. Always room for improvement. All right. So we're going to do, yeah. uh, I just have a few speed round questions and then we'll tie okay. up. Uh, it's been like right. two, over, over two hours now. So I appreciate you, uh, 
playing along for for that sure. long with all of all of my I've got paperwork here. Listen, I got a lot of stuff to to get to you. I appreciate uh, you you uh, taking the time. So we already sure. talked about your best investment under five k, um, the iPhone, and that's uh, I, I think we're going to find that that's true with a lot of people. And then what? So what is uh, the most used tool in your current arsenal? Could be software, it could be hardware. Which is something that you could just not let out of your grip. I, I mean, HV absolutely has been my used, most used tool for for years, yeah. um, and I kind of made an effort to focus in on simulation. So that yeah, absolutely couldn't do without it. I think that's a, a good place to focus your efforts because I'm with you. Yeah. So I did a podcast recent, recently with Eugene Lishio where I was the subject. Um, and he was asking, you know, do you try to do a simulation on every case nowadays? And I was like, you know what? I, I, I do. I, I, it's rare that I don't run a simulation. Um, it does happen from time to time. Sometimes I don't need a simulation to answer the question at hand. But for the most part, I do. And it's a yeah. skill worth developing. And there are, you know, not everybody has to get Simon, you know, if you don't have the money right. to do that, there's HVE CSI. I don't, if that's what it's still called, that's what it's called yeah. last I knew, but, and that's reasonably priced and you can answer a lot of questions with a simple platform yeah. like that, yeah. quote unquote, simple. Um, what tool, I, you and I talked about this a little bit before, but what, uh, what tool do you think you won't be using anymore in five years or 10 could be five or 10, like something that's just phased out that was probably my hardest like i struggle to think about what tool i wouldn't use you know because it's like we have all these new tools that we keep getting in the industry yeah. um and I, and i can't think of anything where i'm like i'm using it today and i won't be using it in 10 years i can tell you something that i was using before that I have that I don't use at all. Like that would be a laser transit, like a surveying equipment. Um, I think people still use it and it has its place, but I don't use it at all anymore. So I think in 10 years that in our industry, that may be completely gone. I think laser scanners, drones, and we'll talk about the future, but when we get to that, but I think that there's things that where that's, that's pretty much in our industry gone. Now, in the measurement world, I think it still has a huge place, you know, for for capturing uh, very you know accurate points long distance. Um, yeah, but in our world, um, it's not. Yeah, not I'm with as, you. I started uh, Axiom in 2018, and I developed a list of tools that I needed, and I took out uh, a necessary loan to buy all of those things. And one of them was not a total station at that point. I yeah. figured that with uh, I started with a Faro M70 very cost effective. And if I am very deliberate in the order that I perform my site inspection, I think I can get everything done with just a scanner. And by that, I mean, photograph the evidence, then mark it, then scan it. And if you do that, you're going to capture what you need to capture for the most part, especially when you put a drone on top of that. Um, if you're allowed to fly there, of course, we all have to be prepared for those sites that you can't fly. And when there's roadway evidence and you can't fly, you just want to pull your hair out. But the, the thing that I, I think might kind of fill that gap a little bit is RTK. You know, some of those RTK tools you can get for under $5,000 right now and you can still touch the evidence and mark the point. And uh, yeah. it's, ver it's very easy to, to work with and they're very affordable and they're very accurate um, and they're compact. Yeah, and um, they and they and they work well with our other tools also. Yeah, yep. you know, like our drones exactly. and so yeah. the interface, set together. control points. Um, okay, so then yeah, like you were saying, kind of alluding to, we're now going to start talking about what tools people won't be using. But what do you think will be in everybody's toolkit in the in the coming five to ten years? What what is everybody's kit going to look like? Like, what's something that will absolutely be in there? So I think in 10 years, everybody will have a mobile mapping station of some sort, what, you know, where you could drive down the road and map the road while you're driving. It's out there already, but um, it's, it's costly. Um, mm -hmm. But I think in 10 years, it'll be down to the level where, where it's getting into our industry. Yeah. Um, 
if right now, if you're interested in just three dimensionality, the systems that you, you know, you can get a system that works really well where you drive down the road and you can capture a scene in 3D um, pretty well. If you're interested in, in roadway evidence, then, you know, it's different. You're probably going to have to go a little slower if you want to be able to capture that same information. But, but I think that that's going to be the tool of that, that a lot of people start to add to their arsenal. I'm sure there's some out there your way that, that, uh, yeah. Renee Castaneda has that mobile Leica station that he throws on the back of his Tundra. I think it costs as much as uh, a nice house in a lot of towns. Um, but it's, it's yeah. very, it can be useful at times. I mean, most of the, like you're saying, most of the times we can just fly a drone and we get really good data and then combine that with some scan data to make sure everything's kosher. Um, but that I, really would be nice to be able to drive down the roadway and capture. And, and we're close. I mean, like you're saying with just the cameras that are set a known distance apart. I, I, I think actually Kineticorp wrote a paper about this several years back. And I've been thinking about trying it too, is just put two GoPros on the extents of your truck and point them in a direction that helps you capture everything and then bring them into a program like uh, reality capture and I think that it even has the capability of reading the GoPro's GPS coordinates. So it knows where every photograph was taking approximately. And then you could build up a good model if your frame rate's high enough and you have a high powered camera. Uh, but adding LIDAR to that would be huge and seems completely feasible. Yeah, especially given some of these cars today that have LIDAR on them already. I mean, you have cars that are being produced with LIDAR that are you know, able to map the, uh, the world. Um, and so, you know, probably eight, 10 years ago, um, I, I was at a conference in DC and a guy gave me a drive in his car with a, with a LIDAR system mounted on the back and was mapping the roadway as we were driving around, you know, and that was eight, 10 years ago. It was a Velodyne, which is used heavily in the car industry now. Um, but they had, a, uh, a little 360 LIDAR system. Uh, they called it the puck at the time. I don't know if they still call it that or not, but I think it's like 16 lasers or something like that. Hmm. And you just, you could drive down the road and it, it mapped it. Now it didn't colorize it, but it created a three dimensional map while you were driving, which is, that was 10 years ago. So I imagine, you know, Renee's system, I don't know if he's using like the double Faro or, or what kind of system he's using, but they have lots of different types out there that, that can actually not just map it, but also colorize it at the same time. Um, Zeb Revo, you can walk with it and it, Oh yeah. It, it uses, um, it uses slam technology and, and accelerometers and it, it's basically a camera and a, and a LIDAR system and you walk around and it, it basically maps as you're walking. Um, uh, uh, Recon 3D. Uh, I saw Eugene post, I think he ma walk, walked across a bridge and walked back and mapped it, walked around a building and mapped it. Um, and that's all from an iPhone, you know? Yeah. So to me, mobile mapping is going to be, um, Leica has the VLK uh, to go, which is again, like a oh, slam, yeah. I think, system that you can walk around. Uh, so all of those technologies are going to, uh, eventually lead to something that we can use on a regular basis on our scenes to, to, to map them out at a level that we're satisfied with the accuracy and being able to testify to it. Cause that's what it ultimately comes down to. Um, that sounds so, awesome. I would love that yeah. dude. Just be able to drive through the site prior to, you know, during the site inspection and, Oh, I got all that mapped out. Now I can get to my photographs and fly yeah. the drone, I guess, if you want some photorealistic ortho mosaic or something, but, yeah. um, yeah. spending, you know, I'd rather spend the majority of my time on analytics and as little as possible on the tedious things that are costly to the client, but not necessarily benefiting the analysis a ton. You need to do it, but if you can shorten it, make it, uh, uh 10 times quicker, then you get more time to spend on the analytics, which is really where the rubber meets the road, in my opinion. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you my little spiel on uh, on scanning, um, where I think that it's it's been absolutely wonderful for our industry to be able to go out and three D scan things. It's a quick way of of mapping, right? But the one thing that I think it it hurt in a way is when you're out at the scene and you know you have to scan and you know it's going to take a long time to do the scans. You 
you have to also remember that you're there to observe the evidence, especially on an, a scene that, you know, happened um, where there's still actual physical evidence. And um, I, I, I have to make an effort sometimes like, OK, study the evidence first, like make sure you do what you would normally have done, which is when you're out there and you're like when you actually had to document the evidence, you were studying it. Because you had to, you had to look at it and say, I want this point. I want this yep. point. Why those matter. That's I want to document them. And now with scanners, it's like, oh, just set the scanner up, let it run, move it, let it run, move it, let it run. And then we have everything we need. But you didn't actually take the time to, I'm not saying you, but, you know, you know remember to take the time to actually study your scene so that you're thinking about the accident while you're there. You're thinking, what do those marks mean? What, you know? why do I need those marks? What could they possibly yeah. have been from as opposed to, I ah, will just look at it later in, in the computer. A lot of times looking at it later in the computer is not as easy as you would think. Um, because it's like, Oh, where's that mark in this giant point cloud? <laughs> you yeah, know, exactly. Uh, and if you're not, if the, uh, photograph wasn't taken from exactly the right angle or the polarizer is not set to the right uh, angle. It, you can't see it as well as you can while you're there. And if you don't mark it while you're there, yeah, I totally agree. And one thing that I try to do, sometimes I find myself perform the site inspection by myself and those are, are brutal inspections. Uh, I find that I am much better served to bring an associate with me to handle the scanner so that yep. I am not focused on that at all. And I could focus on taking my photographs and observing the evidence. And yep. like you said, doing, doing the things that are important, you know, that's where our level of experience comes in handy because when your yep. boots on the ground, you make observations that are critical to the case and pressing the scanner button is uh, important to memorialize things, but that's not the most important thing. That's yeah. a good point. Now, I, I'll give a, um, a plus to the Trimble X7. Mm -hmm. um, it has the ability to, after you do a scan, to look on your tablet at, a, at the, the scan image. And if there's something in there, you can annotate it right then and there which is really a cool feature. So if you do have marks, like the beginning of a mark, the middle of a mark, and the end of a mark, you can actually mark it in your, in your scan on the scene so that when you go back and load it into the computer, it already has that, that marked for you. Uh, which I think that's a huge, yeah, helpful. that's a huge yeah. benefit. And then correct me if I'm wrong, um, I think Calvin Ricard showed me that you can shoot a laser beam, like a visible laser, at the evidence and after you've run the scan and say, Hey, get that exact point. And then it'll do a little cluster of scans right around that point and be like, bam, yeah. okay, there's your point. Yeah. yeah and really Calvin's cool. the Calvin's the man. And yeah, he, he, he yeah. um, he's the, absolutely, you, you can do like a high res scan of a point. If, if you're using your scanner, you can actually use it in a similar way to create ground control points when you're out at the scene. Cause you can scan in those, those points at high res. And then when you have your scan data, it's marked like that point is then marked in your scan data so that you can use it later for, if you are doing drone imagery for your GCPs. Um, the other thing that the, and I think the Leicas could do this for a while too, but um, now with the X7, just again, the things I like about it that they added in the last six months, <clears throat> you can do a, a quick scan, two minute scan, no photos. And then select a box around what you want to scan with photos in high res. So for example, if I'm doing a vehicle, I set my scanner up, I can do a two minute scan and then I can go in and just draw a box around the actual vehicle and then scan that at the highest resolution. But instead of taking, you know, 15 minutes, it only takes four minutes because it's only doing a small, smaller window. Um, which I think is also huge. And I think Leica's could do that. I know uh, Pharaoh's for a while, you could select an angle. Like I only want to scan from, yeah. you know, zero to 25 or whatever. I think when they came out with the premium, they have that similar uh, option uh, as Trimble does. I'm not sure if Leica has it or not. And that's one of the benefits like you're talking about just with how phones have affected things, tablets have too, because now we can see what we've scanned in pretty high detail in real time and then yeah. modify future scans accordingly. Yeah. And it's registering in real time, which you can then see, Oh, I need, I'm, I missed something. I need to fill in this gap. Yep. 
which yeah. is great too. Yeah. Because there's been times when you get back to the office and you're like, wait a minute, what happened to this 50 foot section? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's the part that no, I Dang it. <laughs> oh man, that's the worst. I know when you're flying blind, you just like, you're done with your inspection. You have an SD card and you're like, please SD card, have everything I need on it. Please. Yeah. It's better to know beforehand. Um, anything else that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask you about or any other topics you think are worth bringing up before we start winding down? No, I think we hit everything. Let me just give me one second. I think that was, that hit every, every topic. Awesome. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I, I try. I, I mean, I have four p pages here, four pieces of paper, lots of notes. So uh, I'm glad we were able to to cover most things and well, everything that both of us wanted to talk about. Um, yeah. Where do people go to to keep up with you, to keep up with HVE, to keep up with uh, momentum? Where should they uh, f seek you out? Yeah, so EDC is uh, edccorp.com. Um, Momenta is uh, Momenta M O M E N T A L L C dot com. Um, I'm on LinkedIn. That's probably the best way to, to reach out to me is through LinkedIn. Um, <clears throat> or call me anytime. Um, 410 Um, nice. and I love, uh, yeah, I love talking about, uh, recon and I love talking about simulation and I love talking about blender. So any of those topics I'm, I'm interested. Uh, and I think it's also really important to remember how connecting with others in the industry is important. It's been huge for me in my career. And so. Um, I encourage others to, to do the same thing. You never know who is going to make a major change for your future. And uh, it's happened to me a couple of times and it's been great. So, yeah. yeah, I totally agree. And I've really enjoyed our conversations over the past couple of years. I've been one of the people to, to give you a call and pick your brain on certain things, um, including obviously these low poly meshes and then uh, Blender. And I will probably take you up on your offer to uh, to ring your uh, phone and talk a little bit more about blender in the future. Um, yeah. so yeah, thanks so much, Tony. I appreciate you taking the time and, uh, I, uh, I'll be talking to you soon. All right. Thanks Lou. Hey everyone. One more thing before you get back to business. And that is my weekly bite-sized email to the point. Would you like to get an email from me every Friday discussing a single tool, paper method, or update in the community? Past topics have covered Toyota's vehicle control history, including a coverage chart. ADAS, that's Advanced Driver Assistance Systems, Tesla Vehicle Data Reports, free video analysis tools, and handheld scanners. If that sounds enjoyable and useful, head to lightpointdata.com slash to the point to get the very next one.